Hello everyone, welcome back to Ask a Scientist Gaming, where we combine mediocre gameplay with expert science. I'm Ken Hansen, Associate Professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at Florida State University. I do light-driven chemistry that's photons hitting molecules and materials and generating energetic states that you can do stuff with, like... Uh, synthesis, reactions, generating electricity, generating mechanical response. But more importantly, joining me today is Dr. Susan Letourneur. Susan, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. I'm Susan Letourneur. I'm a professor in the chemistry department at FSU. Um, in my group, we use molten metals as solvents. We like to grow uh, magnetic materials, so we throw a lot of uh, uh, rare earth elements in there or transition metals uh, into our molten, sol molten, molten metal solvents, anything with an unpaired electron. Um, to try and get those unpaired electrons to align and give us some cool magnetic properties. Um, we also are interested in growing semi-metals and semiconductors that could be potential uh, thermal electrics or solar cell materials. So we do a lot of reactions with silicon, dissolving silicon and molten metals like magnesium to grow um, metal silicides that might be uh, of interesting uh, properties. They grow as beautiful crystals and uh, we do a lot of x-ray diffraction to look at structure and then we do a lot of properties measurements. All right. What do you teach typically? Um, uh, I often teach uh, general chemistry, Chem 1045 uh, or 1046. Um, and um, uh, uh, other times I teach a graduate course in solid state chemistry. Uh, next semester, it's going to be interesting because I'm teaching, uh, uh, hopefully, if, if, it, if it's greenlit, I'm going to teach a materials lab. So a laboratory of materials chemistry, and I'm going to need to ask you some questions about the the, the solar cell lab. lab. Yeah, it's yeah. been a while. So <laughs> it's been a couple of years in the making. Yeah, I hope it's uh, going to be on. We'll see. Yeah. All right. Equally important. What game are we starting with? Um, can we do Frogger uh, or Cubert? I, I promised um, Cubert okay, in, the, Q in the post. So let's. <laughs> There's Cubert, ladies and gentlemen. This is a classic. I think the original was like 1981. So go ahead and hit start, and then A. Well, I'll start, and then A a bunch of times. Yeah, that's the right button, that one. And we should be good to go. <laughs> so, Susan, when was the last time you played video games of any kind? <laughs> oh, man. Well, I mean, we had uh, Pong. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We could have played Pong tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I remember this one from you know the bowling alley where my mom played, uh, you know, bowled. Uh, sh they had this in some sort of big blocky thing where you sat down and you played. Yeah, like the little tabletop. Thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So these controllers are a little weird with this tiny little. Yeah, that's true. We can't capture the the, the joystick nature Sorry. of it. <laughs> no worries. It's in our title. Mediocre gameplay, yeah. expert science. <laughs> but Susan, you gave the best description of your gaming cred credentials. Vague memories of playing video games. Yeah. <laughs> this will be ridiculous, which is awesome. Exactly. Well, it's kind of fun. Is so my previous guest was Julian Grasso from the College of Music, actually. And so she... The, she's the, the the contrast where she's been playing video games all her life. She has like 13 consoles. He, she literally made a career out of video games where she talks about music in video games. And that's what she publishes, which is kind of crazy. And then Susan comes on and says, yeah, I'll give it a try, <laughs> which is amazing. I really appreciate you joining me because it's it can be intimidating, especially <laughs> especially since you haven't played in a long time. Night. All right. Say good night to the dog. Be shy. Good night, Brent. So yeah, it's been a long time since you played video games. Yeah. And also I'm forcing her to play on a Nintendo controller rather than a joystick because we didn't tr tr test the joystick, so I apologize for that, but it should be fun. <laughs> Calm down, Bronco. You have 10 minutes to enjoy the stream. All right, do you have any immediate questions? Usually we give our guest a little bit of time to settle in, but you only have 10 minutes. Go. Speed round of questions. Do I have bear? Oh, you don't have to. I'll, I'll feed you whatever questions come up. So, yeah, you can. Is this the first repeated game other than NARC? No, we've had Super Mario World, Super Mario, the original. Uh, Mario Kart is a common one. There's, 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 there's been quite a few. Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, we've repeated that. But, yeah, we... She's the, the first one to play it first, so she'll get the unique uh, YouTube image. So that's kind of fun. Yeah, Bronco, hope grad school is treating you well. He's a former FSU student that oh, okay. got into grad school. K 
can't remember. I think it's UMass Amherst. That's oh. where he ended up. So polymers. Yeah. Uh, polymers? They're they're good at polymers, right? They're kind of well known. I do not know that. That's that's interesting. He's more biomedical related. But yeah, hopefully it's going well. And you got away from hurricanes, which is <laughs> kind of nice. I mean, you'll get so snowstorms in no time, but you missed out on the, the hurricane scare we had in Tallahassee. Is it, Jumped right off. You like it's coming back? <laughs> I'm, I'm dying a lot. I'll be dying a lot. Yes. I'm definitely happy to keep my electricity, yeah. I mean, we were, yeah, Thursday and Friday was really nice outside. Not to be a jerk to those in Central Florida and Tampa and whatnot, but. Yeah, it did cool it down a little. Yeah, no, it was sunny and no, no rain for like a week, which was pretty amazing. But yeah, Massachusetts will be fun. My daughters are very unhappy they're going to bed. Uh. They're at that age where they want to stay up all night, huh? Yeah. Well, there's there's like intellectual thresholds where they just their brains can't calm themselves. They just they they take intellectual leaps where they're just they're thinking so fast they don't know how to respond to it. Oh, it's wow. kind of crazy. Oh. Yeah, I've learned a lot from the, uh, the the developmental psychologists actually. Just asking about my own kids, which is kind of fun. <laughs> Anyway, you've had a little bit of time to settle in. I mean, so you get this uh, badass description of your research where you get to grow crystals in molten metals. Yep. And the terminology for that is flux synthesis. That's right. So five-year-old Susan playing Pong was not destined for flux synthesis necessarily. <laughs> what what path led you to where you are today? Um, well, in graduate school, I was working um, on zeolite chemistry. And, uh, but my, you knew like early on you wanted to do chemistry. That was, oh, yeah, yeah. I pretty much made up my mind by the time I, you know, when I went to University of Virginia as an undergraduate and you have to sign up for classes, and yeah. I immediately was in the death chem track, you know, so it was pretty much chemistry major from the get go. So, how did you know that going into college? I honestly don't remember. I, I, I didn't have... <laughs> there wasn't a key moment that changed your life forever. It was just. Yeah, I don't liked remember, it. like, you know, I don't remember any groundbreaking, um, like, high school teacher that, you know, rocked my world or anything. Um, I just always liked the logic of it. I mean, it just kind of makes sense. And, you know, it was cohesive and um it's logical you know i like the mm -hmm. oh, jump on there um oh. <laughs> no worries <laughs> it's like i honestly have never used one of these controllers so oh really yeah never? this is this is an original nintendo controller actually yeah, yeah so you probably had like the atari joystick single button yeah 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 but anyway, you went to undergrad, chemistry was your path, and then eventually led you down inorganic chemistry and in particular flux synthesis. Yeah, um, I was in the Stuckey group and they had like all sorts of different, I mean, Galen Stuckey had projects that were like biomimetic materials and zeolites and nanomaterials and this, that, and the other. And I, you know, I gravitated to the more inorganic aspects of his group. Uh -huh. And, um, yeah, just sort of went from there. I mean, but crystal growth, inorganic solid growth is one thing. Growing it in molten metals. For those of you that don't appreciate that, she essentially turns metals into liquid state and then does reactions in that as the solvent, which have to be hot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, uh, I think it's the... Um, it's really good. It's a really good medium for crystal growth. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you grow a vial full of beautiful, shiny, well-ordered crystalline materials, it's satisfying. Mm -hmm. um, Pretty photos, at the very least. Yeah, I need to encourage my students to take more photos. We need to update our web page. Yeah. Um, you should do our strategy: the once a week Twitter photo. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, I've seen your uh, uh, your wall of uh, awesomeness. Yeah, no, I really love that wall. 
And I look back now because it's been like almost five years since my first cohort graduated. But they have their photos up there and their signatures and yeah. And they're turning it back on you too. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, so so undergrad you started gravitating. Grad school, you were in a group that was very diverse. Postdoc. Um, McCurry Canatidis's group when he was back at Michigan State University. Mm -hmm. Um and yeah, I got full into flux chemistry there. Um, he had a project funded by the Navy to make uh, aluminide alloys, like strong aluminum alloys. And to strengthen aluminum, you basically want to make you know, precipitates of intermetallics within the aluminum matrix. And nobody really had an understanding of what those precipitates were. So we were sort of aiming to grow them as their own phases in excess of aluminum. And so we were doing a bunch of aluminum flux reactions to look at these strong psilocides. And of course, we were also throwing rare earths into them because some of the rare earths do help with the strengthening. But um, yeah, silicon, rare earth, aluminides, and uh, you know, those fluxes grew like really nice crystals. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so, oh, geez, stop <laughs> turning back. Now it's almost done. <laughs> That's how they get you. Oh, you can kill them. Look okay. at that. Yeah, you just stepped on the one that was changing the colors back. Oh. <laughs> All right, calm down, Bronco, as a follow up on that. What are the crystals made of and how do they handle the heat of molten metal? Um, well, the crystals basically um, precipitate out of the molten metal as you cool it. So um, you take this mixture of elements and um, one of them is in large excess. You have one element that has a low melting point that's present in large excess and that's basically your flux so if you want to do a uh, reaction to molten aluminum you have like 10 millimoles of aluminum with like one millimole of silicon and rare earth and stuff like that then you heat it up the aluminum melts it dissolves everything and then you cool the reaction down very slowly and you basically get these precipitates forming and they basically precipitate slowly out of the molten aluminum and, you know, the slower the precipitation process, the bigger the crystals. So um, then you need to figure out a way to separate your crystals from the molten metal. Um, sometimes you can etch away the excess flux um, with like an acid or a base. Mm -hmm. Other times you can basically decant it while it's still molten, which sounds crazy because you're reaching into like a super hot furnace, grabbing a tube and tilting it or flipping it upside down to decant the excess metal away from your crystals. Um, and, uh, but, you know, we've got gloves and, you know, all, all sorts of safety gear. Um, and, uh, what's that little strawberry I just stepped on? Oh, well. Um, so, yeah, you basically um, figure out a way to separate your uh, product crystals from your flux. And... Sometimes the flux element will be incorporated into the product. So if you're growing something out of molten aluminum, um, you're going to tend to incorporate aluminum into the product. Um, but other times the flux is basically inert. So it's sort of an inert additive or inert solvent. Is that, is that strawberry a good thing? I don't know. The um, one that's changing colors you can stomp on and kill. You uh, won't uh, change the colors anymore. Okay. What I gather, don't quote me on that. <laughs> I mean, so, so the, 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 the casual like analogy of what you're describing, if somebody puts you know, sodium chloride in water and lets it dissolve, or dissolve and heat it up and whatnot and cool it down, you can grow crystals. Right. But you're doing that instead of water, you're using aluminum is the common one, aluminum tin. Um, yeah, well, you know, gallium is an attractive one because, you know, gallium pretty much melts in your hand. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I mean, any metal can be used as a flux as long as it has a reasonably low melting point. Uh, sometimes you can use mixtures that, you know, on their own, these metals would have high melting points, but if you mix them together, they lower the melting point. Mm -hmm. um, so we do a lot of those types of things where we use mixtures. Is that, is that a colligative property? That's, that's essentially, I mean, well, if you look at the phase diagram, yeah. you have the melting point of the pure metal down here, and then you have the freezing point depression. So you're adding huh. a solute basically. See gen chem students, this stuff is useful. <laughs> <laughs> I promise it's not just an exercise in gen chem. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
That's that's pretty amazing. What's the hottest you've he heated up a metal? What's the... Um, well, our furnace is max out at 1,200, although we do have a high-temperature furnace that goes to um, 1,500. Um, but mostly, we generally go to like 1,000. That's enough to get everything molten and get the crystallization products uh, process going as you cool it slowly. Oh, finally, ah, nice. Jeez. <laughs> you earned that one. <laughs> Man. They only get harder from here. I don't even know if this game is beatable, actually. Mm. Oh, Bronco has a follow-up. Let's dive right in. Uh, what's the craziest accident in lab in, in your or lab you've worked in? Craziest <laughs> accident. Well, um, when I was in graduate school, uh, I was a little overzealous in quenching some of the alkali metals that I was using, Oof. and caused like a big old smoke. Uh, um, you know, smoke release, and that triggered the fire alarms, and the fire department had to come. Hmm. So I was the one who had to sheepishly explain what happened <laughs> um, to the firemen. Um, I mean, but j just smoke, no damage from that one? Right, yeah. 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 I've never, luckily never had any, like, major damage. Yeah. And we had an evacuation of our building fairly recently. Were you around for that? No. It was it was like a I don't it was like Thursday morning or something like that. Um, but is somebody was burning plastic in one of their labs and set off the smoke alarm. So huh. they evacuated the building and fire department had to come in. So yeah, smoke but no damage to anything. Yeah. And it smelled like burnt plastic for a couple hours. <laughs> so yeah. So that's the the Worst accident, but not too bad. In terms of people getting hurt or anything, you haven't had to deal with that. No. It's like, me, I cut myself with some glass the other day, but, you know, that's pretty much the most dangerous thing. Um, and you guys use blow torches too, right? Yeah, we use a, a, a hand torch to seal off our, our ampules. Um, and, uh, you know, that takes some... There's a learning curve there, but, you know, once you get it, you the, the blow torch is really easy to use mm -hmm. um let's see. Oh, that's that's fun i mean the follow-up we usually ask to the craziest accident is what's the most expensive mistake you've seen in lab in my lab in your lab or any lab you've been a part of um expensive mistake uh well an embarrassing and ra and somewhat expensive mistake happened in grad school um, and this is embarrassing because I should have known better. We were, um, doing a, a, a flux reaction, and I actually started doing flux reactions, uh, in grad school in Stuckey's group. Um, and we needed to, let's see what was happening. We needed a tantalum container because our flux was reacting with the alumina crucibles that we used. Mm. Um, and so we had a tantalum container made. And we, you know, talked to the machine shop, and they built it for us, and they built this little thing to, you know, it was a tantalum cup and a, and a lid, and they built this little thing to compress it so the lid would stay on tight, and, you know, you wouldn't get oxygen leaking into your tantalum. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I loaded it in the, in the glove box, and I screwed it together, and I and I put the whole thing in the, in the furnace, and I totally forgot that tantalum oxidizes. <laughs> You know, instead of a nice tantalum crucible containing my product, I open the door and there's a big white powder. <laughs> just, tantalum rust. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, a, it's a big pile of white tantalum oxide is what I got. So that was embarrassing. I really should have known better, but I was like, you know, in grad school. And I, yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. only made that mistake once, presumably. Yeah. Oh, man. I mean, so that's interesting. You have to do your reactions in unique environments because you can't use, I mean, glasses start melting, right? And like, yeah. Um, so, like... We use quartz tubes and mm -hmm. that, well, we shouldn't say quartz because it's not crystalline quartz, it's fused silica. It's just a uh, amorphous glassy silica. Uh, that melts at like 1500 degrees. Okay. But quartz will react with many of the metals that we use, like, you know, magnesium. If you're using magnesium as a flux, that's going to get eaten by, you know, that's going to attack quartz. So you would need to have an additional crucible inside the, the quartz, like, you know, it was sealed steel ampule or niobium or titanium or titanium um and all of that sealed within a quartz jacket so it doesn't oxidize so yeah there's uh, vessels within vessels within vessels and um you have to consider the reactivity of your 
flux, uh, flux metal, your reaction components, and all of those things. So have you ever made something accidentally cool by having it like react with the chamber? All the time. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's serendipity. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, you, you got you gotta. I always, I always tell my students, you know, when you're doing elemental analysis, be sure to test for the crucible material. Yeah. Because um, you know, if it incorporates, you need to keep that in mind. Um, and, you know, if it is crucial. You need to be able to reproduce the awesome material that you accidentally made, so mm -hmm. you've got to, you know, factor the possible vessel reaction in. Um, and that's that's tough about crystal growth because it's it's subtle, right? I mean, very subtle nucleation sites or initiating agents or something. Oh yeah, it's like uh, we're actually. I mean, the trouble with flux chemistry is it's very much a black box. I mean, your reaction is taking place in an excess of metal. In a, in a crucible, in a quartz ampule, in a furnace. So we can't see what's going on. It's not like a you know a crystal growth from water where you just sort of open up the furnace door and glance and you can see the crystals growing. It's a black box. So what we sometimes do is we um, do in situ measurements, like in situ neutron diffraction, to try and see um, the crystallization events. Because neutrons are awesome. Neutrons can actually penetrate the ampule, the crucible, the excess flux, and they can actually see the crystallization of the products that um, they're growing. But unfortunately, you know, neutrons just, you know, they don't grow on trees. You have to go to a, a national lab and... Why is this not going? Uh, get up, you know, get beam time at a national lab. Um, but yeah, if you can do that, it's a great um, opportunity to get some very impressive measurements. Um, and we just published a paper in inorganic chemistry uh, looking at a gallium flux reaction. Mm. So we were able to, you know, dissolve cerium and nickel in excess gallium. And we were able to see that you get one phase forming at high temperature, and then it converts to another phase once you cool it past a certain threshold. Huh. So if you quench your reaction at high temperature, you're going to get one product. If you quench it at another temperature, you're going to get another product. So, um, really, you're getting more bang for your buck. Because yeah. You're getting more than one product, and both of them could be cool. And the typical way of doing flux chemistry is you cool, you know, you, you cool the reaction down as far as you can go, and you, and you basically centrifuge while the flux is still liquid. Okay. So you basically look at the melting point of your flux and say, okay, I'm going to cool it down to just above that and then I'm going to stop the reaction. But the compound that's existing in the flux at that temperature might not be the only compound that forms. Maybe it's the second compound. Maybe it's there was a high temperature phase that you missed, and then it converted into this low temperature phase. So there's a lot of chemistry going on in molten metals that we don't even know about. So these in-situ diffraction measurements are awesome. They give you the opportunity to see what you're missing, basically. You just stepped on a freeze timer or something. Freeze bad guys? Yeah, That's the, awesome. the green things are, the little green spheres are freeze the bad guys. Huh. Just, yeah, I did uh, not play Qbert much as a child, if, if that wasn't obvious. <laughs> yeah. uh. And going to the National Labs is always fun, because you get to, you know, See all the big toys and all the beam lines and yeah. So that's Oak Ridge that you go to. Yeah, Oak Ridge is within driving distance, so we uh, um, it's pretty easy to just drive down there. Yeah. <laughs> no, so I saw Oak Ridge when it was first being built, actually, at least one of the reactor chambers. Really? So I did this. I accidentally got into a RU program that I probably shouldn't have got into, but like my sophomore year of undergrad i decided i wanted to do chemistry i had a really good organic chemistry professor and i was like i like this for the same reasons you did like it's structured right it's there are rules behind how this stuff reacts and you can manipulate the interactions and it was like panic mode because it was like february and i want to do an ru program and like a lot of the deadlines are in february and march and so i applied for an ru program that was the summer in solid state chemistry 
which was <laughs> just a coincidence that I did solid state chemistry for a summer. But what was amazing about the program is it wasn't just at one university. What they did is they flew us out to Clemson. And so Soji Hu was actually running the program. Oh, he's So awesome, they yeah. flew like 12 students out to Clemson. Then we all went out to our respective in, uh, institutions for the summer. And so I spent the summer in Slavi Sivov's lab at Notre Dame. Cool. And so I did like moth and, and uh, Z-like growth, things like that. And then we went back together at the end of the summer to actually um, like give presentations and talk to each other and do classes. So I got a summer course in uh, solid state chemistry as a sophomore undergrad, which is pretty crazy. Yeah, that, that started my career in chemistry. I was like, I love research. Let's do this. <laughs> Let's continue this career. But I met like Hanno Zerloy and Soji Hu and uh, um, who else was there? It's been a long time. Mm. But yeah, the, the entire solid state community. Ultimately, I didn't end up doing solid state chemistry, at least not traditional solid state chemistry, but fun tools nonetheless. But part of that summer experience was they drove us to uh, Oak Ridge, oh, cool. and that was back in 2003, so it was still being built back then. Neat. So yeah, got to see the, the birth of a particle accelerator, which is kind of cool. I hate the strawberry guy. <laughs> Get him. <laughs> <laughs> now it's personal. <laughs> That's really fun. Well, the last time I was at Oak Ridge, uh, uh, the neighboring beam line um, is being... The new beam line's being built. <laughs> um, so it was kind of neat to see a concrete being poured and a cube. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Dang. No! <laughs> uh, supposed to be fun in video yeah. games <laughs> or or vendetta i don't i take gaming way too seriously i will never play a multiplayer game on stream like the online shooters and stuff like that i will just rage way too much <laughs> it's inappropriate for live streams <laughs> so you've played video games since you were like how old i since i was like five wow. it's, it's been an integral part of my life for almost four decades now <laughs> three Three and a half decades, video games have been... Yeah. I guess you're, you're just slightly older, you missed the, like, Nintendo when that took over. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when I was in graduate school, they were still doing that thing on the computer where it was, um... It was just a black screen with symbols, and little, uh, you would pick up a, a vial of something, and yeah. it like a little, um... Uh, I guess, explanation, explanation point, and... Uh, yeah, just old school, just ridiculous stuff. When, it's like, when I finished grad school, they were just coming out with stuff like Doom. And, mm. um, I could never get past the first level, so it's just like, this is clearly not for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's definitely a commitment. Yeah. Learn the controls. So Mike Shatruck actually played Wolfenstein 3D, which was the precursor to Doom. <laughs> oh, man. So he was really into that while he was in grad school. But yeah, the, the, if you look at the statistics now, it's pretty astounding. I think the average age of gamers is something like 35 or 36. And it's just because, yeah, it's been around since Nintendo was 1986 when it first came out. It just took over. Now we play video games while talking science <laughs> on a live stream. <laughs> and we can switch games at any time if you want. If you get frustrated, it's totally up to you. We yeah, let's do Frogger. Endless. Frogger, it's time for some Frogger. Yeah. All right. Let's switch over to Frogger. All right. Transitioning to Frogger, I'll update the name. Yeah, the controls in Qbert are a little weird because it's like you're at 45 degree angles. Yeah. <laughs> but your controller's 90 degree angles. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> at least relative to normal. 
But yeah, anyone who's joining us, ask a scientist, gaming, mediocre gameplay expert science. Our guest today is Dr. Susan LaTurner. She does flux synthesis, which means she does reactions in molten metals, which is high temperature reactions in a unique environment that gives you hopefully unique crystal structures, um, which is kind of fun. Uh, she's also an editor for the journal Inorganic Chemistry, which I'm sure this is a whole other different type of experience. Um, and she's playing Frogger. So if you have any questions, feel free to throw those in chat. We'll be happy to answer those. Um, while we fill up these holes with frogs. <laughs> what a ridiculous game premise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, one of the all-time classic favorite video games is Frogger. What's that little thing? Is that fly there? Is something, something I'm supposed to avoid, I guess? I think you avoid that one. I think if you get the frog with a bow, it gives you an extra life. Oh. Which you don't need because you haven't been alive, so. Yeah. <laughs> so, any any thoughts on today's Nobel Prize announcement? Oh, well, I was hoping for moths. Yeah. Isn't that, is moth formation a form of click chemistry? Because, I mean, those, uh, uh, <laughs> those metals sort of click into place and... Uh, uh, let me look up. What is the formal definition? So those of you that don't know, Nobel Prize in Chemistry was announced today. The the winners, um, Sharpless, Meldahl, and Bertozzi. So it's for uh, click chemistry and bioorthogonal chemistry. Click chemistry is just a really clean reaction that puts two things together. And then Carolyn Bertozzi took that and applied it to biological systems because it's such a nice clean reaction. But click chemistry, I think it's just any reaction that's super clean it doesn't make any byproducts or side products click chemistry definition some of the nice parts about having two people is we can look up our answers in real time mm -hmm. darn Click chemistry is not a single specific reaction, but describes a way of generating products that follow examples of nature, which also generates substances by joining small modular units. That is too ambiguous, yeah. too, too open-ended for a... Yeah, you do a reaction. End of. <laughs> <laughs> the end. Call it click chemistry. Yeah, reaction A plus reaction B. Click. <laughs> it's perfect. It falls right into my gen chem class. Yeah, this is a very, like, bio-heavy definition. I don't know if I trust you on this, Wikipedia. <laughs> I'm curious how much this has been edited in the last 24 hours. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, so, FSU Chemistry, we have a contest every year to see who can predict the Nobel Prize, and one of them got it this year, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. oh, getting that final thing is going to be hard. So, I'm, I'm, so, your pick for the next one is MOF Chemistry? Yeah, I'm sort of hoping Moff gets it one of these days. Yeah, we'll see. The the so if you look at Nobel's will, it was specifically for the betterment of mankind. So you have to do something useful with it. Well, I don't know if Moffs have done that yet. Well, I seem to like Jeff Long is using them to store carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. Like you know, they can be you can functionalize their walls to be sticky towards certain kinds of molecules, so you can use them for separation. Of course. <laughs> They're chump change next to, next to zeolites. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, you know, I'm an inorganic chemist, you know, so it's like, let's keep the organic stuff out of here and just make zeolites. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're more stable, right? Yeah, it's yeah. It's inherent Therm in organic. stable, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, that was my, like, talking with Omar Farah about this. It was like, after 30 years, there's like three commercially available products. And I think it's that stability issue. Like, why would you use that instead of a zeolite? Right. Yeah, and I was actually at the Gordon Conference this uh, this summer, and they had a couple people from Honeywell, and they were talking about like the zeolites that are actually used. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what are they uh, used for? There's got to be some like chemical processing. Oh, gas all sorts capture. of things. Uh, I mean, it depends on what zeolites you're dealing with, but some are um, some are catalytic. They they crack petroleum basically. Um, Commercially, like yeah, that's an actual wow. Zeolites are the backbone of the petroleum industry. Yeah, yeah zeolites. Well, yeah, okay. I, I was thinking moths. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. What are moths used for? 
I recall it's like um, there was a p possible hydrogen storage. Mm -hmm. That was so, the original pitch. Yeah. yeah. So instead of having like a big old cylinder of hydrogen, you can increase the um, capacity by putting a MOF in, which basically, you know, is sticky towards hydrogen or something. Yeah. And increases the uh, um, capacity, the storage capacity. Um, this game is completely lacking music. <laughs> boink, 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 boink. <laughs> yeah, exactly. for, for Super Nintendo, I have a fun factoid for every, anyone that wants to know. This was the last game officially licensed for the Super Nintendo system. So Frogger was the last game for the SNES. They decided they didn't need a soundtrack, apparently, despite being able to do it with their processor. So I don't know. All right, we're, we're about a half hour in. Should we do one of our predictions? Sure. Any any, any favorites? Uh, these are them. Um, yep. Well, I've sort of I've sort of answered the first one. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. We can throw it up there. Yeah. We'll we'll see who's paying attention. It's mm -hmm. like a quiz question. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. How do you get the frog in that? One to the left. You just gotta catch. Ugh. So close. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, standard internet units. Get ready to spend them now. If you're not following us, click the follow button. You can get your standard internet units and gamble them. They're useless, except you can request a factoid. You can make us drink alcohol. I'll make me drink alcohol tonight, which is fine. Um, or you can just have pride in answering the science questions correctly. So I'm going to pop up a prediction right there. The question is, what metal melts in your hand? Is the answer indium or gallium? One of those two will actually melt in your hand. Uh, so if it's on the table, it'll be fine. But as soon as, as soon as it's in your hand, it's a little bit warmer. It's enough to melt a metal at room temperature. And it's one of, what, two liquid metals at room temperature, right? Or room yeah. temperature-ish? Yeah. Oh, nice. There we go. I don't like Congratulations. So yeah, put your predictions in there right now. If you haven't done it before, the predict button at the top of your chat, just click that and you can gamble as many of your standard internet units as you want. The question is, what metal melts in your hand? Is it gallium or is it indium? Note that you are on Ask a Scientist Gaming Honor Code. You can't look up the answer on Google, although it's a pretty easy answer to find. Um, but make your predictions independent of secondary sources and to have pride in knowing the actual answer. So, question is, is it indium or is it gallium? Which is it's just one of those fun all-time factoids. Mm -hmm. I can't believe they didn't just add some sound effects to this. This is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it's just it's a classic think, like game. Kermit the Frog singing or something. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was fun. So, so uh, our last guest, Julian Grasso, the 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 music theory in gaming. That we we got some history insights. So the first game to have an actual soundtrack was actually Space Invaders, because oh, when they move across the screen, they make a sound, but it's not the same sound. It, the pitch actually changes. Um, and, and the pace of the song actually changes. So that was the first. I take it the alligator is bad. I don't know. Is it because the bug was okay, right? Oh. oh, you ran out of time. Oh, there's a time limit? Yep. The wow, Earl that's Yellow so squid the... game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even... Squid game, the game. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't even see that. Uh, the, I'm like one of the like two people on the planet that doesn't have Netflix. Yeah. But, you know, you see all the outtakes. It's like, okay, the red light, green light game has a time limit. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Did you watch it? Yes, we did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's one reason I would like to get Netflix just to watch that. I mean, it's not that expensive per month and there's enough movies, but Well, I've already got like a bunch of different Doesn't that suck? Yeah. <laughs> like it's just it's turning back into cable and it's just the worst. Yeah. It just makes people want to pirate again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Susan, so what is the answer? Gallium. Turns out everyone guessed gallium. So nobody got any points on that, but congratulations, you have pride in knowing that it's gallium. So gallium will melt in your hand. So mercury is liquid at room temperature. Gallium is liquid just above room temperature. Right. Those are the two metallic. So gallium, it's the 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 gallium spoon, right? That's the classic. Yeah, exactly. Dissolve the spoon in your coffee. Um, 
I think francium is close to being liquid at room temperature. Um, no, not francium, cesium. Cesium. Yeah, the heaviest of the non-radioactive alkali metals. Um, cesium, I think it melts at like 40. Well, that's not too bad. Um, then of course you can all, make all sorts of like low melting mixtures like NAC alloy, sodium potassium alloy that so, melts it. So cesium is 83.1 Fahrenheit, 28.4 Celsius. Yeah, it's practically in your hand, but yeah, you, you that's... don't want that in your hand. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that will Good react readily when it's your hand. Yes. It'll melt, but it yeah. won't be fun. Yeah. <laughs> It was cesium. Oh, man. So congratulations um, for those of you that got points I, or that got the answer correctly. You didn't get any points because everyone got it right, but we appreciate you putting the answers in there nonetheless. Too easy, huh? So, so yeah. Well, th that's the hard part of these predictions is you never know. And who knows? Maybe they were listening earlier. You let oh, that yeah. one slip through there. That's right. Yeah. But no, thank you for the answer. And again, if you guys have any questions, put them in chat. Susan's happy to talk about inorganic chemistry, crystal mm -hmm. growth. Um, <laughs> we have a diamond question. So I'm notorious in my gen chem class for at this point for ranting about the diamond industry. Uh -huh. <laughs> and yeah, just crystals in general about Ruby being only like 1% doped chromium and all of a sudden it's six order magnitude more expensive than aluminum. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> Whole industry is a scam. Yeah, well, I mean, you take regular old uh, alumina, mm -hmm. you know, take your crucible material and dope it with a little bit of titanium, and suddenly you've got a sapphire or a laser material, and dope it with a little bit of uh, chromium, you got a ruby. That's fun. Oh, man, i got to get to that one over the left again. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's the fun part about crystal growth. So I've had, I have another rant I do. This is just a very quick one about crystals and their healing powers. Oh, <laughs> oh, man. So I guess that leads me to one of our standard questions we like to ask. I mean, what is the flat earth or anti-vax equivalent in your field? What is the, the lunatic answer to problems? Well, you know, you mentioned the whole crystal healing properties. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Um, Okay, the flat earther thing in solid state chemistry. Um, well, I guess that's uh hmm. Let's see here. What was the question again? The 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 like I don't know, the lunatic's answer to solving problems with solid state chemistry. Anti vax, earth is flat. Crystals heal you, magnetic field bracelets. I mean, um, a lot of them are in healthcare, but there's also some in like, you know, foods and stuff like that. Maybe certain mm -hmm. salts are bad for you or others aren't. Well, I mean, there's a, a, a lot of hype around, uh, you know, high pressure superconductivity. Uh -huh. um, you know, if you take compounds and put ridiculous amounts of pressure on them, they'll become superconducting. But then, you know, you find, you find out that, you know, it's just an impurity um, <laughs> uh, or creating a short in their measurements. Um, so, yeah, so that's not common public. That's that's in the field that just a mistaken measurement. Yeah, right. Because we had. Um, Oh, who do we have? We had Christian Beekman on. We were talking about superconductivity. And there is a room, according to the publication, there is a room temperature superconductor, but you have to do it at like a thousand gigapascals or something ridiculous to actually make it conduct. But I guess that one's still controversial then. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, yay. Nice. Congratulations. <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> then the cynical frog telling you to get ready. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, one thing that um, I complained vociferously about in my class is the overhyping of perovskites. And um, the halide perovskites are potential solar cell materials, and they're mm -hmm. very versatile, and they have direct band gaps, and they're easy to make thin films of. Mm -hmm. And so everybody's pouring into this field. Yep. And what happens when you get an influx of huge numbers of researchers is they all want to maximize their, you know, their readership and their H factor and their you know, citations. So they're going to cram perovskite into their paper somehow. Yep. They're going to call these compounds that are nowhere near being perovskite. They're going <laughs> to, if they're, if yeah, they're yeah. honest, they're going to call them perovskite related. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, look, if you want to call something a perovskite, 
something's got to be octahedral. Okay, yeah. it can't just be, well, it's a, you know, it's lead surrounded by a bunch of ligands. It's perovskite. No, okay. Yeah. Uh, you have to have something that's octahedral, and preferably those octahedra should share corners and give you at least a two-dimensional or a three-dimensional array. They're, they're calling these chains or isolated octahedra. They're calling that a perovskite. No, yeah. Okay, not on my watch. <laughs> so what's the, I, I thought it was just the ABX3 was the formula, right? Like if it meant that it was perovskite or is it, it is a lattice, it's a particular lattice? Um, well, there's three-dimensional perovskites and there's layered perovskites. Mm -hmm. Those are valid perovskites. Those have mm. either a three-dimensional perovskite structure or slabs of, of perovskites mm -hmm. um, interleavened with slabs of like organic or whatever. Um, but when you have just like octahedra in a one-dimensional chain, it's like, mm, you're, you're really reaching. <laughs> <laughs> Perovskite related is being generous. Yeah, okay? yeah. But it's got a cation and it's got some lead and some halogens. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and the, the lead's count. a problem. I mean, yeah. the lead, uh, um, you have to get the lead out, basically. And this frog needs to get the freaking lead out, otherwise it's going to die. Yeah. No, B B Wu and I have had this debate several times about the one D and zero D perovskites because they don't follow the ABX three and they don't have the crystal. But I think it's it's one of those things like he knows it and a lot of people in the community know it, but it's just become such commonplace that it's just accepted incorrect nomenclature at this point. Not on my watch. <laughs> so when you review yeah. no, I mean you're an editor now. You yeah, I'm to... an editor and you know I'm gonna tell him, look, you know, this is not a perovskite. So, um, but there's a lot of crap out there in the literature, people just getting away with, you know, calling things that perovskite. It's like, you're just trying to be cool. Stop it. <laughs> so, so you don't have to answer this, but as an editor, do you shoot it down at the editorial stage before um, it goes to review? I basically uh, tell them that they have to change the, the, the wording. I, I don't necessarily totally reject the paper completely but mm -hmm. i will tell them this has to be rewritten rewritten so you and don't call these it. isolated octahedra perovskites <laughs> i mean that's that's the goal of the editor right to to, to gatekeep this propagating mistakes and things like that so yeah. I, I i fully appreciate that yeah words have meanings yeah no exactly you have to have standardized nomenclature otherwise mm -hmm. you can't converse in any meaningful way so. yeah it's like you know uh, i had this uh this one paper where these guys were trying to um they were giving like they were calling something microstructure you know like dude microstructure has a meaning you can't just <laughs> try to redefine the word microstructure okay uh -huh. in science microstructure has meaning like they had structure, just the size was not micro. Is that the? Yeah. I, well, microstructure. I, um, I mean, they were basically looking at clusters and stuff, and, mm -hmm. and instead of you know, um, yeah, it was just wrong. So <laughs> I was just like, dude. And, oh, hyperfine structure. That's what oh, they were trying to define. Was. Okay. I was like, look, hyperfine structure. It's like that has to do with uh, you know EPR and splitting and all that. Yeah. And they were trying to you know. They were looking at a, a like a crystal structure and local environments and disorder and there's like and the, you know, there's microstructure and there's hyperfine structure. Like, dude, no, 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 no. words have meanings. Come on. They just threw the word soup together. Yeah, yeah. Oh. And I'm just like, no. No, one of my so, most cited recent papers is actually perspective, and it's in uh, ACS Energy Letters, and it's like nomenclature within the up conversion community needs to be fixed <laughs> like you just here's what we're suggesting the rules should be and it, it's been cited really well but it's there's a problem for us like when you say quantum yields right it's photons out per photons in mm -hmm. but some people multiply it by two because up conversion has two photons in one photon out and so your maximum efficiency is 50 percent. so they're like i'll just multiply it by two and report that number i'm like <laughs> no. that is not a quantum yield <laughs> these yeah. words have meanings the yeah. iupac definition has meaning so stop that okay. <laughs> quantum yield means this let's be consistent mm -hmm. so i i feel for you and if i was ever an editor i would have those same vendettas like there are rules people yeah so perovskites though overhyped yeah well i mean you know they do have awesome properties yeah but you just gotta respect the definition of the perovskite structure, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nice. Okay. 
<laughs> I don't know why the frog has to look so just bored <laughs> with your yeah. gameplay. Well, I noticed that, you know, in Qbert, the, the little guy s s swearing when he gets hit, so I don't buddy. <laughs> just raging. Yeah, uh, it's like, I picked the games where everybody swear swears and is cynical. <laughs> Dang. Oh, uh, I like Bus it. Bus lane is going to be fun. So, I mean, have you seen any of these, uh, the, the, the crystals that can heal people? Have you kind of stumbled across any of that? Oh, yeah. I mean, if you go to any sort of, uh, I New mean, age health, yeah, whatever. like the, the stone age, that yeah. store that sells, uh, they sell crystals and all sorts of, I mean, paraphernalia for, you know, stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they've got a, a bunch of crystals and each of the crystal display has a little card about the healing properties of, uh, <laughs> I'm like, dude, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh. So I mean, so so I love I, I would love to teach Gen Chem and Bridget and I have talked about this teaching Gen Chem from a case study perspective, like bringing up something like that and saying, you know, here's what we know about energy and how energy is transmitted and stuff like that. Like, because they're what's underappreciated is there are very bold scientific claims behind every one of those statements. And there's a one of the examples I showed in class was they there were like it was like tantalum rings that I think it was tantalum. But they had rings that when you absorb too much negative energy, the ring breaks. Oh. <laughs> exactly. Wow, okay. <laughs> but, I mean, like when you think about the claim, it's one, that your body emits negative energy, mm -hmm. whatever that means. Two, that tantalum can absorb this and you're somehow changing the structure over time. And three, that at some point it changes the structure so much that it actually breaks. Well, I mean, if you put that tantalum ring in a thousand degree furnace, uh, it'll oxidize and then, yeah, <laughs> it'll break. <laughs> then you got uh, second year Susan in grad yeah. school. <laughs> <laughs> the machine shop made this with care and now i just like oxidized it and it's a pile of white powder <laughs> yeah the tantalum rings to absorb negative energy oh man i'm really? never gonna make it past these buses yeah uh, let's see here maybe if i go over here no it's definitely a sweet spot of oh, well not there of getting across the road i like it Gallium. You should make gallium rings that melt when you have too much negative energy. <laughs> <laughs> this is just reinventing the mood like, ring, okay? All that was was a liquid crystal, is that right? Yeah, yeah, it was a thermochromic, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, but that one's at least it delivered what it said it was going Well, it depends how they advertised it, right? Did they pretend it was, uh, it was your mood, like the mood ring or mood shirts? Or was it just a oh, so close. thermochromic? Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those one of those scenarios where I'm like, what if we used our powers for evil? Like, <laughs> what if you and I just sat down tonight, brainstormed something we could sell to people that were, I don't know if gullible is the word, but like, mm -hmm. want it to be true. Like, that's mostly, whoa, jeez. <laughs> this frog is just in and out of traffic. Yeah. You earned that one. That was beautiful. No, I didn't. <sighs> Not quite all the way. Dang. But yeah, it'd be really funny, fun just to like debunk claims during general mm. chemistry. Mm. Mm. They were clever in changing the rate of these different lanes. Yeah. This has been a long time. So tonight I'm drinking rum and coke. Susan's not a drinker. She's drinking uh, drinking just coke tonight, but I'm adding rum to it. It's been a long time since I had a rum and coke, so I, I appreciate the change in in uh, venue. But it's a dangerous drink because mm -hmm. it's like, oh, it's sugar water oh. plus alcohol. Yeah, like a Long Island iced tea or something, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. can sneak up on you if you yeah. go too fast. <sighs> But yeah, anyone just joining us, Dr. Susan LaTurner, she's happy to talk about crystal growth, synthesis, talk about flux synthesis, growing crystals inside liquid metals, which is kind of crazy. Um, uh, beyond that, she's an editor for Inorganic Chemistry, is happy to answer questions related to that, or, or as much as you can. Uh, no details divulged on anything, but just general life uh, as an editor. Um, anything else? Yeah. <laughs> frogger yeah. <laughs> your opinion how, about how, frogger. how to die in frogger yeah many oh, many yeah. times yeah. i mean that's that's why we do infinite lives that's what makes it fun yeah 
And so I was looking up, like, people have made modern versions of these that are, like, three-dimensional. And, like, yeah. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a rabbit hole. I want to go into it. It's like the pacing is just perfect to not give you that gap. Yeah. Dang. <sighs> so for the solar cell lab, we might need to like get some uh, um to do the the IV measurements, mm -hmm. I guess. I mean, are you going to loan us some stuff or uh, uh, so you can do it with a like handheld voltmeter. Really? Like a $10 what used to be Radio Shack voltmeter. Yeah, yeah. You just hook it up with alligator clips on the end, do a voltage setting, and then do the current. Hmm. Like that's the 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 what they do with high schoolers. Huh, okay. So yeah, you don't need an actual salt simulator. They're not worth it. Ah, okay. They're not good enough, but that's gonna be interesting. Yeah, I'd like to do a dry run of that before the students get to do it. I mean, so so we're starting a materials chemistry lab in, at FSU, and so Susan's going to be running that. And she asked for help coming up with various different experiments. And so one is build your own solar cell from, I think we, we did like raspberry juice, right? Yeah, yeah. Or something like that. Blackberry but juice, one, raspberry juice. Yeah. One thing that I, in retrospect that I'm, I'm not happy about with that type of lab is it's very like cookbook prescribed here's the steps here's what mm -hmm. you do and it's it's a lot less like i've heard it described as you know exploratory labs mm -hmm. where you just give somebody a pile of parts and you know solve some problem yeah one of the labs i'm postulating is going to be like that where um it's like one set of students will get the you're going to get the reaction that i know will produce a magnetic material but then this team of students swaps out one of the components and i don't know what's what you're going to get so um so yeah, it's sort of uh, labs that are not just cookbooky. They're also you're literally doing stuff where we don't know what's going to happen. That's um, pretty fun. Yeah, so I think you know, one of the labs is designed for that. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, as long as they're fun, yeah. <laughs> like entertaining and interesting, because yeah, I've, <sighs> I've read too much chem ed literature where there's not a whole lot of support for lab actually increasing chemical knowledge. Really? But it'll actually, it does help with things like number of chemistry majors, passion for chemistry, interest in chemistry. But it's like, it's, it's I mean, the, the problem is the way we do most of our labs. They're cookbook, mm -hmm. right? They're right. prescribed. You're following instructions. You're getting an outcome. Mm -hmm. And they're far, a far detachment from the actual like science and research experience. Right. Where you don't get obvious answers or you don't get, you know, the way it has to turn out. Yeah. Um, yeah, this one lab is like a barium ferrite. Fer ferrite, I think. Uh, barium ferrite is the sort of brown material that's in your magnetic swipe cards. <laughs> so if you uh, open your wallet and you have one of those magnetic swipe cards, it's this uh, barium. It's actually barium hexaferrite. Uh -huh. So uh, you know, one of the st one of the students will make that, and then another student will swap out some of the iron for something else and see how that affects the magnetic properties. Another student will swap out the barium for something else. And, you know, I'm not going to give them the recipe. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give them the main recipe for the barium ferrite, and then they have to go in and figure out what ratios to try and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, that's fun. So, um, yeah. Uh, I didn't know it was barium ferrite. That's fun. So yeah. they, like, just, just distribute that in a particular pattern, and that's how they... Yeah, so they... Strips. Yeah, they, you know, distribute it and, you know, put it on the strips, and then they, you know... Basically, uh, it's magnetic ones and zeros. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. That's why my swipe card never works in CSL. <laughs> that did back you, door. <laughs> uh, did you uh, demagnetize it or something? No, or? no. It, it, it's just that door, the the, the south side door. Mm -hmm. just, it like breaks every other week huh. or doesn't work. Yeah. The one near the parking lot? No, no, no. The one. Uh, you know, the, the one by the tennis courts, like right across from the, the by Mike Tharp's office. Oh, okay, right, yeah. That yeah. one rarely works for some reason. I'm huh. not exactly sure why. Yeah, I usually come in near the parking lot and take the stairs. Yeah. And man, people who drink coffee don't know how to freaking walk. <laughs> it, it, it's, oh, they're it's, just like, covered. It's, they're covered in coffee. I'm like, learn how to freaking balance your coffee cup. Oh, you got to set up a camera in there and just make a compilation video. Yeah. We'll put it on the chemistry YouTube page. <laughs> just shame them. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, that's amazing. All right, we should do another prediction. Which one do you want? Uh, science, non-science. Uh, non-science. Non want to do the sport one? That's sure. fun. All right. We have another prediction coming up. If you haven't followed us, click the follow button. Um, we're going to put up a question right now, a prediction about Susan LaTurner, actually, which you can't possibly know unless you know Susan personally and or you, I don't know, alluded something from what she's answered to questions tonight to answer this question. But kind of a fun fact, Susan was heavily involved in one sport. The question is, which sport was it? Is it figure skating or tennis? And so, yeah, <laughs> you haven't revealed this one yet. <laughs> I think this one's this one's still a secret. And obviously, I have not been in a sport involving frogs getting across roads because I'm not doing very well. I cannot get past these buses. But yeah, throw your guesses in there now, or you know the answer. Is it figure skating or tennis? How confident are you in your voting? <laughs> Go one way or the other. It's a while. I like the personal questions because one of the reasons I do this Ask Scientist Gaming is to like humanize us, mm -hmm. right? Because our students see us as just like you teach and you research and that's what you do, right? You don't have any personal life or background or experience. You're just there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dang. How do I get past these buses? So, yeah, you guys have about a minute left. Did Susan do figure skating or tennis? Uh, the legend of tingle welcome back it's good to see you thank you for joining us yeah it has been a while it's crazy time flies that's for sure we're almost halfway through the semester already oh my god it's what it's 18 down 20 to go something oh, like wow. that in terms of lectures and i just gave my first problem set i need to come up with an exam oh, boy. <laughs> that's a graduate class how many students do you have um I have like a 10 that are officially enrolled and, you know, a bunch are sitting in for fun, I guess. I, I don't, but, uh, yeah. Um, so there's, uh, it's a good size class. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's comfortable. Not too small, not too big. Mm -hmm. A legend of tingle. Yeah. I apps coming up January 4th to the 7th registration should be open sometime soon. That's the inter-American photochemical society meeting. Oh, okay. It's actually, it was going to be in Tampa, but we decided to move it this cycle to, uh, um destin actually and so it turns out the timing was really good because a hurricane just went through sarasota and tampa so yeah destin that should be a lot of fun yeah i look forward to crossing paths with you there it should be a really fun meeting it's fun to be going back to conferences again yeah i like uh, i like traveling yeah i mean call me crazy but i really like flying because i mean we can freaking fly <laughs> <laughs> understand how, how people can be blasé about airplanes like i mean a miracle of we can freaking fly okay i mean i like sitting the window seat near the wings so you can see all the flaps and stuff yeah um but yeah it's like that's cool there's a pretty amazing Louis C.K. rant about flight. And it's like somebody's on the plane complaining about not getting the right peanuts or snack, but uh -huh. like you're in the air. Yeah. 10,000 yeah. feet off the ground. This is a miracle. What are you That's complaining right. about? Yeah. <laughs> you are absolutely right. Actually, Saturday, I have like 24 hours of travel ahead of me. I'm going to Italy for a conference, and it's just like nice. three layovers. And yeah, that's my first international conference since COVID. Wow. So, yeah. Where in Italy? It's in Milan. Nice. So yeah, that should be pretty fun. So I'm flying through Amsterdam, which Igor warned me they're going to lose my luggage. So good to know. Well, Heathrow is the one where infinite, you know, that's infamous for losing luggage. Yeah, especially this last summer, it was bad. Legend of Tinkle, th Tinkle, thank you for the Prime subscription. We really appreciate it. We don't necessarily need your financial support, but if you guys want to use your Prime subscription, by all means do so. If you if you have Amazon Prime and a Twitch account, you can attach the two and give someone free money directly from Jeff Bezos. So, <laughs> Legend of Tingle, thank you for making him write us a check. We really appreciate that. <laughs> tennis, she played tennis. All right, Susan, what is the answer? Figure skating. Susan was a figure skater. So no. dry bone, sorry. Uh, now, let's not get it twisted, okay? I started figure skating as an adult. Uh, so I was not like one of those like super duper awesome figure skaters who starts w when they're four and they, you know, start when they feel. Yeah. Because when you start any sport as a kid, 
you think you're immortal. Yep. And you're you know, fearless. you're yeah. fearless. So you're like bombing around the rink full speed. And you know, if you fall down, you're just going to bounce back up again because kids are made of rubber. And if anything <laughs> happens, mom and dad will take care of it. I'm not going to wind up, you know, and I miss school. That's awesome. Yeah. But if you start skating as an adult, it's like, oh man, I'm going to yeah. break something. If I fall, I'm going to have hospital bills. I'm going to have to miss work. Blah, blah, blah. So there's like a, you're a little slower, yeah. but um, yeah, it's still, you know, I actually started when I was in graduate school in California. Wow. And, um, yeah, I had to drive down to Ventura because Santa Barbara didn't have an ice rink. Yeah. Um, so I started taking lessons there, and then I did my uh, postdoc in Michigan. And Michigan, it's, it's right on the border, so you can't swing a dead cat without hitting four ice rinks. Yeah. So there, there are literally four ice rinks in Lansing. So <laughs> pick one. Um, so I took a lot of lessons, and but you know. I, I wasn't doing triple jumps or anything like that. You know, mm -hmm. I could do like the single jumps and I could do spins. I, I enjoyed spinning because it's basically a free high, essentially. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like you're basically, you, you're getting a little stoned. No, for those of you that haven't gotten skating, I strongly recommend it. Like that's the closest you feel to like flying on mm -hmm. the ground. Like yep. just the smoothness of it, the elegance. I mean, after you learn how to actually skate. Yeah. <laughs> I grew up in Minnesota, so I learned at a very young age, but I wasn't by any means taking classes or anything, but you didn't really have a choice. Like you're gonna skate. I grew up next to four hockey rinks mm -hmm. within walking distance. Yeah, right? yeah. That's just the way it was, but man, that's crazy. What inspired you to take up figure skating in grad school? Um, uh, I guess the whole, well, actually, you know, it was the whole Tanya Harding, Nancy Kerrigan mess. <laughs> Yes, yeah, you I wanted mean, to club some kneecap. That's <laughs> exactly, what you're yeah. doing that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I do but, remember that. Um, but I, I mean, it, it, it was a huge amount of publicity for the sport, and yeah. they were, you know, putting on TV more often. And you know, I, I just it was really graceful, and you know, uh, when you skate, it is a great feeling. If you feel like you're flying, and you know, I just really loved it, and so um, yeah. So in Michigan, you know, I was taking lessons and. I actually was in an adult uh, nationals figure skating competition at like a really low level, but yeah. that's just, I mean, I had a whole little costume that I wore and, yeah. and I, you know, choreographed a program and cut, cut a piece of music to the right time and stuff like that. that wow. Was, you cut your own music. That's well, awesome. Well, no, I, I went to like okay. back in the day when, before everybody had like this crazy setup that you have back in the day, you had to go to an expert who would like cut it and cause he had the technology and stuff like that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so uh, it was it was an interesting experience because I mean, you know, you, there was the outfit and the makeup and the choreography and you know, and on top of that, the whole skating thing. And, yeah. Um. So yeah, it was. Uh, it was That's very interesting. fun though. Like I, I I do like adult competitions in sport mm -hmm. as long as you don't take it too far because then it doesn't have the like imposing pressure of a parent and things like that. Yeah. Like the young yeah. sports do, and especially figure skating when they peak at like sixteen years old. That is so devastating yeah it's like, like the way they're doing now like with the girls throwing all these quadruple jumps it's like some of these some of these girls aren't going to be able to walk without pain when they're 30. yeah because that's a lot of wear and tear on the joints and the body and uh yeah so uh no that's that's you're describing me actually really? I, I did i was hardcore into sports like i was which sports football basketball track and karate wow was, black belt yeah no no, my junior year of high school is when I peaked. We were like state champions in football, four by 200 meter relay and track. We were runners up and I uh, won a Diamond Nationals fighting championship. And it was like awesome at the time, but now like I pay for it. Right, right yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's but another one of those like people wouldn't believe that about me. Like right. I don't seem like a sports person, but huh. yeah. But karate, taekwondo, ju judo? Or it's an Americanized karate. So okay. it's our Americanized taekwondo. So it still had, you know, punching and kicking. And it was it was point-based. It wasn't like MMA-type combat. But, yeah. yeah, point fighting. Well, there is a um, uh, Cora Lind, who's a solid-state chemist. Uh, I think she's at uh, Toledo. She's, like, a nationally ranked martial artist wow so she's a professor there and she missed this summer's gordon conference in solid state chemistry because she was she had a tournament <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. awesome so yeah it's like we got some very uh, uh impressive sports you know uh, athletes mm -hmm. so yeah it's so. underappreciated we do have hobbies outside of <laughs> the main world 
Um, yeah. But yeah, it's one of those after like three knee surgeries and a shoulder surgery. I'm like, I'm kind of done with this. I'm yeah. going to ride my bike to work. And that's the extent of it. Yeah. <laughs> Legend of Tingle. Can't forget ping pong wizard. Yeah, I played a lot of ping pong. Met what, what met my wife playing ping pong, actually. But that was casual gameplay. So who is Legend of Professor Turner, I remember during my REU, I remember I Brian, Ryan worked in your lab and presented. Okay. Um, so Ryan... Oh yeah, he was one of my RU students. He presented, so he did a flux chemistry project in my in my lab. I think that would have been what three years ago. Yeah, I think he was working. Uh, he was using molten sulfur as a flux and growing mm -hmm. metal sulfides. Um, <laughs> yeah, when it comes to mechanism, it is very much a black box because you know it's hard to basically interrogate a reaction that's happening in an excess of molten metal or molten sulfur inside an ampule inside a furnace um so we don't know about the mechanisms um and that's i kind of envy organic chemists because they know that okay if you react molecule a with molecule b this group is going to go right here mm -hmm. in organic chemistry we don't have that kind of understanding which is why some of the in situ measure you know measurements that we do the institute of refraction at least that gives us an idea of it's not just one compound that grows. It's actually, you know, first you form this high temperature phase and then it transforms into this other phase and transform. You can actually get a cascade of multiple phases. Um, there have been, uh, it's like metal flux chemistry is harder to sort of monitor that way, but there have been work uh, in salt fluxes by actually Canacetus, who is my postdoctoral advisor. Um, he had uh, students doing salt flux chemistry and salt fluxes are a little more transparent to x-rays. So you can actually do, um, x-ray diffraction and monitor the it has to be in a synchrotron but uh, you can actually monitor the different phases that grow in and grow out um, with molten salts um, for metals you pretty much need neutrons because neutrons are more penetrating than x-rays and um so yeah but but that's 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 one of the big mysteries that's that's a holy grail that's a holy grail of inorganic chemistry, being able to understand mechanisms, being able to control reactions and target materials. And, you know, the more we learn about what's going on in these metal, you know, molten metals or molten salts and which phases form first. And, you know, maybe we can understand which building blocks are formed first. And then they, um, what I'd love to do is there's, um, there's techniques like pair distribution function and things like that, where you can actually look at local environments and clusters, because diffraction only gives you the long range crystalline materials have formed. Um, it doesn't give you first the nucleation, you know, first you form this cluster and then it nucleates and, you know, we're missing that aspect of the understanding. And, you know, the trouble is you need like really specialized measurements, you need beam lines, you need all, all this sort of specialized stuff to, to even begin to try and look at that. So yeah, understanding mechanisms in these molten metals and molten salts, it's very tricky. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so the answer is we know a little, but not a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, sulfur, liquid sulfur, doing a reaction in liquid sulfur. Yeah. It's a basically brimstone, fire and brimstone. Chemistry. I was going to say that <laughs> smells, right? Like every time you open that, it, um, yeah, but, uh, um, there's been a lot of work on, um, sulfide salts, like, uh, the Canacetus group, uh, um, he was working with like sodium sul sulfide and sodium polysulfide or potassium polysulfide, which are basically chains of sulfur atoms. And each sulfur on the end has a negative charge. So you need to throw in like, you know, sodium or potassium. And that has a low melting point, those, mm -hmm. those polysulfide salts. And so he would use those salts as his fluxes. Mm -hmm. I was going around, I was addressing it from the other way because you can put iodine with sulfur and basically use the colligative properties and, you know, freezing point depression. So I was using sulfur iodide melts. Mm -hmm. um, and so at least in mine, the smell of the sulfur was leavened by the, you know, disinfectant smell of the iodine. The Canacetus group, man, there was one dry box that the sulfide chemist used. And they would crack that port <laughs> open and say, clear the lab. If they weren't we're leaving. Just so, a stink bomb. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just, so, oh man. Yeah. What do they use for actual stink bombs? It's got to be a sulfur. It's a thiol of some kind, right? Yeah, yeah. And actually, I was uh, just, uh, I had an undergraduate in my lab, and I was teaching him how to use the torch. And 
um, you know, I turn the methane on and, you know, methane in itself is odorless, but they put that, uh, what is it, mercaptan, some sort of sulfide mm -hmm. in the methane to make it smell so yeah. you know if there's a leak or not. Mm -hmm. um, Ammonium sulfide is the uh, stink bomb chemical. Stink. Yeah, that's a twofer. Because when it <laughs> falls apart, you get hydrogen sulfide and ammonia. Yeah. Oh, one, huh. of, my, one of my favorite minerals is kind of a kind of a stink bomb. Um, sodalite. Um, I, I worked on yeah. Uh, um, I worked on zeolites as part of my graduate work in the in the Stokey group, and um, mm -hmm. the sulfide structure. I mean, the sodalite structure. There's actually a natural mineral sodalite, and it's this beautiful blue color, and it's blue because it's got a sulfide radical trapped in each cage. Mm -hmm. So it forms around volcanoes um, and incorporates the sulfide, and um, it's a sulfide radical, so it's blue. And so if you take a sodalite chunk and you put vinegar on it, you'll smell the H2S coming out. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Huh. So, um, you yeah. have a favorite mineral. <laughs> Actually, you know, you, you laugh, but a lot of people do. Um, you okay. should check out the, the mineral cup on Twitter. Um, I didn't know those things. <laughs> that just finished up. Yeah. Um, it, it's like it has brackets like the the, the basketball thing, um, <laughs> and they have like a series of minerals going up against each other, and people vote every day on this bracket and that bracket. And um, uh, the overall winner this year was fluorite, <laughs> um, calcium fluoride. I think, uh, yeah. So. Um, but yeah, yeah I was People like voting. Yeah, and, yeah, I, I took a picture of my sodalite sample when it was up. It's like, everybody vote for soda. It's so like, come on. Okay. I had a picture of one of my cats like lying on the sodalite sample. It's like, you need to do it for your furry overlord. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, oh. but uh, people are very passionate about their favorite minerals. Mm. But, uh, and of course, you get the, the touchy feely ones who are like, oh, this mineral uh, enhances my aura. It's like, dude, no, it doesn't. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. It's a pretty crystal structure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's uh, Mineral Cup every, every September. Enhances my aura. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, yeah. That, that's the thing I don't get about those claims. Like, it's like at a fundamental level, they don't understand that if something's interacting with the body, it's manipulating your atoms in some way. And it has to do that through a force. Is that magnetic fields? Is it electric? Is it like, this is all measurable. If yeah. this is real, we can measure it, I promise. Yeah, I think uh, somebody did a, um, a calculation about, you know, astrology, because people yeah. are saying, well, my life is affected by how the stars were oriented when I was born. It's like, dude, you're more affected by whether the doctor clipped his nails the night before <laughs> he, he delivered you, okay? It's the mass of his nails makes more of an impact on you than some distant star. Okay? I had not heard that iteration of that, but that doesn't surprise yeah. me at all. Like, that's... Man, when you're talking about 10 orders of magnitude, mm -hmm. two orders of magnitude away, it is nothing, right? Yep, like that's, that's right. <laughs> the nail clippings of what yeah. they ate that morning. <laughs> Did yeah, they exactly. pee or not? Yeah, <laughs> precisely. That's, so. that's enough to influence whether you're a Gemini personality. Yeah. Who was it? It was uh, um, the straight dope guy. Did you ever heard of the straight dope? I don't know who that is. Um, the straight dope is written by, uh, he basically debunks bogus hypotheses um cecil adams yeah that's the guy cecil adams no i feel like i should know this though weekly column in the chicago reader yeah so it's old school i mean okay i don't even know if he's still alive or you know but yeah he had columns where he debunked crazy stuff and yeah and i think that was where i heard about the the nail clippings I'm just not going to get past this. Hmm. Yeah, started in 1973. As of 2013, it was still running. Wow. 2013. Yeah. Well, 2022. So. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know if they've updated the Wikipedia page because it doesn't mm -hmm. say it stopped at any point. Good for yeah. them, though. I mean, there's a lot of YouTubers doing that as well, just right. taking things and debunking. Right. I watched a, a video about, um, there's, there's this, I, I don't know how I stumbled upon this, but it was, there, there's a certain contingent that like restores old, like furniture or guns or all sorts of like old materials. Mm -hmm. And the video was basically saying, here's how you can tell whether a restoration is real or not. Like people will do electrolysis to make guns rust and faster like they'll intentionally damage them so they look really? like they're recovered guns yeah huh they're like faking restoration videos which i mean anything for the views anything for the clout you know yeah. so it goes 
but yeah, we've, we've crossed the one hour mark. We're one hour and 20 minutes in. If anyone has questions for Dr. Susan Letourneau, she is happy to answer them about solid state uh, synthesis, flux growth, solid state chemistry materials, magnetic materials, metastable materials, um, life as an editor for inorganic chemistry. Um, also, her life as a frogger player. <laughs> My life as a just... frogger player is a lot of death. <laughs> it's a lot of death, yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, can I get past this? Oh, shit. Oh, no. I got too excited. So I think that's what you got to do. You just got to go full tilt. I'll be right back and make a YouTube video faking my next paper so someone will do my work for me and debunk it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's been, that's been done. People have... Um, like computer generated oh, yeah, uh, documents and submit them to the uh, pay to publish journals where it's like, just send us a $500 check and they will get peer reviewed, but it's complete bullshit. And they end up publishing that. So it has been done. If you want to pay for it, I guarantee you can get a, you know, an indexed journal article somewhere that has a DOI. Yeah. The computer generated um, writing is going to be terrifying in the next couple decades. So, I mean, Google already starts like, well, even Word starts predicting my sentences, yeah, right? Like yeah. where it's going to go, like mm -hmm. the natural, after, you know, a hundred papers, how can they reproduce my writing, my writing style, my, my way of saying things? You just make every other word perovskite. <laughs> <laughs> and I do. <laughs> Most of my citations are me being a tourist on somebody's perovskite paper, actually. Really? Yep. Yeah. I don't know about most, but they're they're the ones that get cited. I mean, it's such a popular area, yeah. right? Thousands of papers. It's it's kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. Some of those papers are definitely not perovskites. Yeah. <laughs> so if you missed out on our discussion earlier, Susan's pet peeve is when somebody calls something that's not a perovskite a perovskite. So don't do that and don't submit to inorganic chemistry. Hey. <laughs> no, don't, organic chemistry, but don't, don't do that. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's fair. <laughs> Legend of Tingle wants to know, what's it like being an editor? So you've been an editor, what, nine months now? Yeah, Something since like January. That? Since January. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, I mean, basically, I, I get assigned, you know, a bunch of papers to look over. And, you know, basically, I um, think about whether they're appropriate for the journal. And then if I think they're appropriate for the journal, I select reviewers. Um, and uh, sometimes it's kind of hard to find reviewers for people who are willing to review. So yeah. um, that's got to be the hardest part, right? Yeah, it's like, so, you know, I'll, I'll select, you know, the, the, the first run, I'll select like six names for as, as potential reviewers and the, the people, you know, the, the the assistants here will, will invite all six of them and like maybe one or two. So mm -hmm. I got to go back in and invite like, you know, and list three more potential reviewers and maybe one of them. So it's like some papers I'm, I'm, you know, I'm on my like 14th re possible reviewer in order to get, cause you want three, you want three reviews for each paper. Um, yeah. And sometimes it's, it's hard to find people who are willing to review. So I heard from Roper, he serves as a, uh, an editor for, I don't remember which analytical journal, but they, they rank reviewers. Does ACS have a ranking system? Um, there is a grading system where, mm. you know, uh, uh, but the only thing it depends on is, you know, do you review, um, do you review on time and is your review relevant? So you basically get, you know, one through three, how good is this? And so, you know, as you re re review more papers and your reviews are on time, and if your reviews are relevant, then you get a higher, higher and higher score. Mm. Um, but, you know, when we look for reviewers, we can see it's like their last review was, you know, in how many days or like how many reviews are they currently doing? And I try to not overload people with stuff to review. Yeah, yeah. So if somebody's already reviewing three papers, I'm like, okay, I'm not going to send it to them. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, you know, you can tell it's like, okay, this person hasn't reviewed anything for like, for the last, like, you know, 1,672 days. It's like, they're probably not going to be a good reviewer. So, um, that sucks. And it's, a, it's one of those things that a lot of the work falls on a small group of people, right? There's, yeah. there's super reviewers and then there's everybody else. And, yeah. And it's frustrating because, you know, I'll, I'll ask people to review and they won't respond and they won't respond. Then I see them tweeting every day. It's like, you got time to tweet. But uh, I don't know. <laughs> call them out yeah, on Twitter. Well. <laughs> don't, I mean, don't do that. <laughs> they might have the argument, which is valid, that you know this is unpaid labor and blah 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 blah, which is true. Um, I mean that's that's science. You 
yeah. you know, peer review is for the betterment of you and your peers. But well, you owe at least three reviews for every paper you do. So yeah, that's a you know the philosophy that a lot of people have. You know, if I if I get a paper published, then I owe you know, mm -hmm. a certain number of reviews because people reviewed your paper. So you know, the circle of life and yada yada yada. So Tingle has follow up. What's the big difference between being an editor and a reviewer? Um. Well, as an editor, I'm like the the first, uh, first thumbs up or thumbs down. I mean, I basically decide, you know, is this paper suitable for our journal? And you know, we'll get some uh, submissions to Inorganic Chemistry that are basically, we're trying to optimize this particular well-known material as an industrial catalyst. What? Like that is not really what inorganic chemistry does that's more of applied science and acs has like you know journals that are more suited for that sort of uh work like you know journal of applied materials or journal of you know interface materials or stuff stuff like that so i i offer them a transfer transfer to those journals um or if the paper is just a mess and questionable i'm like mm, sorry <laughs> um so there's there's options for the first glance. There's like reject after editorial review, and I rarely do that. That I only do that if the paper is just clearly okay. They took a chapter of someone's dissertation and didn't even bother trying to spruce it up. So I'm like try again. Okay, reject. Um, but like quite often there's like a, um, a editorial transfer or something where you basically say. This material, this paper looks interesting, but it's not um, suitable for this particular journal. Um, can we transfer it to one of these other journals? Um, and then, um, uh, other, you know, for the most part, uh, um, you know, if the paper seems suitable for inorganic chemistry, then I'll I'll send it out to reviewers. And when the reviews reviews come back, I look at the reviews, and you know, the most difficult thing is when you get like three reviews back. One is, I say, okay. one is you know, uh, you know, minor revision needed, yeah. major revision needed. Do not publish. It's like, yeah. uh, okay, what am I supposed to do now? Yeah. So then I have to like you know get another reviewer or try to read between the lines because maybe the do not publish guy is like it's pretty good, but it's not suitable for this journal, and maybe I disagree, and I can override them. But um, or the uh, minor revision has no comments at all. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> you know what the worst is? The yeah. worst reviews. Um, it's like minor revision needed, and that revision is they need to cite all of my papers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I, I, I've I've rescinded reviews reviews who've done that. Okay, because you know you're just trying to bump up your own age. Just stop. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's unethical. Yeah, Tingle, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Cite my papers instead. Yeah. <laughs> I'll never know it was you. <laughs> yeah. You need to cite these 40 papers by Hanson. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, another difference is, you know, it, as an editor, I'm basically deciding, is it suitable for the journal? The reviewers, they their, their job is reading more in depth and judging the science. So the reviewer's job is to, you know, pick out the errors in the science or pick out things that need to be improved. So, um, cause I can't possibly read in detail every single paper that, 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 that you know, uh, goes past my desk cause there's like dozens. Yeah. So I need, that's what we need the reviewers for. It's like, I can tell, you know, I do enough of it, you know, I skim through so I can tell, you know, does this make sense? Does it look pretty decent? Does it look like it, it's suitable for the journal? But I rely on the editors for actual scientific, you know, is, is this scientifically valid? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so you got to pick the, the experts in the field as to review. You got to pick people who are knowledgeable, um, so how many yeah. how many papers do you handle per week? Oh, geez, a couple dozen. Um, and that's just a uh, um, pick reviewers. I I also have to like make decisions and stuff yeah. like that. So it's sort of a cycle of you know this paper's coming back from the reviewers, and then the yeah. revision came back, and I got to do that. And so uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I and mean, luckily the the software is really good. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah so it's pretty a, automated. Yeah, ACS has a very good the, the Paragon Plus software for editors. Um, it you know organizes things really nicely. It shows the reviews in a nice organized way, and it allows you to you know contact the 
um, the reviewers or, you know, make comments of your own and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's an interesting job. I, I like it. So. The legend of Tingle had a reviewer asked to perform experiments that would have cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. I mean, that's one of my pet peeves is that there are reviewers that review the paper they wanted to see and not the paper that's in front of them. Like they wanted a separate endeavor than yeah. what you presented. I, mm. Yeah, I can't imagine how time consuming it was 50 or 60 years ago. Yeah, when There's... people submitted you know, in the mail and then you had to <laughs> mail copies out to reviewers. Oh, geez, I can't even imagine. But you published a lot less. And there were less journals out there. So. Yeah. But yeah, no, that's <laughs> hand drawn figures. Mm, yeah, canvas. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Oh, uh, you know, need to go back. Business. You should do a special issue of Inorganic that has only hand drawn figures. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I did say, you know, I, at the Gordon Conference, I'm only going to look at, like, artisanal posters that are, you know, hand-painted. Because, you know, there's a question about, you know, what's the best software to design your poster? And it's like, PowerPoint is so, you know, tacky. It's like, dude, PowerPoint is awesome. Okay? Yeah, it's it's easy to tool. use. And it's like, you know, people are getting snotty about, well, I only use this specialized, you know, boutique software. It's like, oh, yeah, well, I only look at posters that are hand-drawn. Okay? So <laughs> step off. No. So uppity about posters. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right, we should do another prediction. Which one do you want? Oh, I don't know. This one. Mm, yeah, let's do that. Got a renewables question. All right, we're going to throw another prediction up there. Those of you that aren't following us, click follow, get your points. Let's gamble them on a science-related question. So this one you might have to provide some context for. All right, we're going to throw two minutes up there, get your standard internet units ready. Uh, don't Google the answer, just do it from whatever your intuition is or what you know right now. The question is, how much energy generation is wasted as heat? And so this is like industrial scale, electric plant energy yeah. generation. Any sort of energy generation, like, you know, gasoline burning in your car, uh, coal, coal powered fire, you know, coal, power, coal fired, coal power. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Power plants that use coal, uh, power plants that use you know, natural gas. How much energy is wasted as heat? Oelio. Oelio, we're going to say that's how you pronounce that. Thank you for the follow. Enjoy your standard internet units. Gamble them on this. You can request factoids. You can make us drink. Um, but also you can gamble on this question. How confident are you in the answer to how much energy generation is wasted as heat? Less than 50% or greater than 50%? If I get this wrong, uh, don't take it personally. For all you know, we have some secret embedded trick question here. No worries. <laughs> no pressure. They are imaginary internet points. They are not for a grade or points of any kind. So what percent of energy generation is wasted as heat? Less than 50%? Greater than 50%? Put your guesses in there now. You have about 45 seconds. So my fridge is just this collection of random alcohol from guests because like, I get like six packs and we drink like four of them. It says there's random beers all over the banana place. Banana bread beer? Yes, what this in one the... is banana bread beer. It's banana bread flavoring. Yes. <laughs> so it's a grab bag every Ask a Scientist. So I appreciate the rum and coke tonight. That one's pretty straightforward. Now, speaking of scientists with interesting hobbies, there's a... Um... Pat Woodward, he's a solid state chemist at uh, Ohio State University. His hobby is beer. He literally has a, a website called Pat, Pat's Pints, where he <laughs> reviews different beers and stuff like that. He visit, visits awesome. breweries and stuff. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a good hobby to have. <laughs> yeah, next time you're in class and your teacher asks, does anyone have any questions, you should say, what's your hobby? <laughs> <laughs> Just learn something interesting about your, your, uh, your instructor. Now, I mean, my hobby was figure skating, but unfortunately, you know, nearest ice rink here is in Jacksonville, so I have to switch it up a little. Yeah, what's your hobby now? Uh, I did, like, ethnic folk dance. <laughs> awesome. Like, club or class or what? Do you... It's uh, classes. I take various classes and stuff like that. Where at? Where, where's your... Oh, there's, uh, like, um, they move around. It, uh, arts after school, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the thing about dance classes is, you know, you need a studio with mirrors 
And in this economy, running a studio is touch and go. Oh, so exactly. they rent space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You rent space and you move around and mm. yeah. So that's fun. Yeah, it's it's good exercise, and you learn about you know different cultures and stuff like that. So that's, that should have been a prediction. I like it. Yeah. All right, Susan, how much energy generation is wasted as heat? What is the answer? Um, over sixty percent. So greater than 50%. And that's just inherent to Carnot cycle, solar yeah. cells, any any thermodynamic process for generating energy, greater than 50%. Yeah. And, you know, one of the aspects of our research is uh, um, trying to make thermoelectric materials. Because as you might, you know, understand by the word thermoelectric, it basically takes a heat source or a heat, uh, a thermal gradient, and converts it into uh, electricity. So um, there are certain materials that when you put them in a thermal gradient, they'll just automatically generate a voltage across themselves. And these are thermoelectric materials. Um, it's kind of a rare property because it, you know, it involves a balance of, you have to have a material that has a low thermal conductivity because mm -hmm. the hot, st hot side's got to stay hot, the cold side's got to stay cold. Yep. But the electrical conductivity needs to be decent and it needs to have a high Seebeck coefficient, which basically tells you how much volts per temperature gradient you get. So these materials are usually semi-metals or semiconductors. And unfortunately, a lot of them have elements in them like tellurium or lead or both. Like lead telluride is a good, <laughs> lead telluride is a good thermoelectric material, but unfortunately, eh. Um, that is the curse of chemistry. All the stuff that does really good, cool stuff is expensive, rare, or toxic. Yeah, what's with all those catalytic metals? Yeah, exactly. The rhodium and the iridium the and osmium. Yeah. So. Thanks, thanks, nature. Yeah, you could no, make iron. Iron or, or yeah. copper. Or, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, one of the things we're trying to do is, uh, you know, tellurium is a critical material, so can we make metal silicides? Because silicon is like, you know, dirt cheap and we know how to process it. So one of the projects in my lab is making complex metal silicides out of uh, magnesium fluxes. So we use molten magnesium as our solvent and dissolve silicon in there and react it with other metals. And we crystallize these complex metal silicides. And they have interesting structures. And um, we're trying to, uh, oh my gosh, I'm across. Huh. Oh my gosh. Oh, <laughs> you got the student. Oh, come on. Oh. <laughs> oh, lame. I don't know if you want to see the outcome, but everyone got that right. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> so, yeah. My questions are too easy, clearly. Uh, maybe. You want to pick a hard one? Um, one? Let's see here. This one's kind of fun. Uh -oh. Yeah. Want to do that one? Yeah. All right. We're going to do another one. You guys got that one right. We're going to do one maybe you know the answer to, maybe not. Mm -hmm. All right, this one is not related to chemistry, at least not directly. Does have minerals involved, though. Yeah, <laughs> my hobby. I do hula. It's, okay, yes. Susan's uh, ethnic dancing. She does hula. Um, tallest mountain from the base to peak is it Mount Everest or Mauna Kea? Kea, Kea, Mauna Kea. Mauna Kea. Which one is the tallest mountain from base to peak, Mount Everest or Mauna Kea? So throw your predictions in now, not chemistry related, but we're going to take it. We love all questions, science related. Yeah. So yeah, throw your predictions in there now. Do not Google the answer. Find the keywords as quickly as possible. Yeah. Come on. Never going to. And we just got a set of reviews back that was like... They sent it to two reviewers initially, and one was like, this shouldn't be published. The numbers aren't high enough. And the other one was glowingly positive. They mm -hmm. did an adjudicating reviewer, which took another month, but it was positive. So fingers crossed. But it's like you accidentally get two just cynical reviewers or just off-base reviewers, and it tanks your paper. It's just frustrating. Thankfully, it didn't happen. I think we're going to be accepted, which is really nice. All right, what's your guys' guess? Is it Mount Everest or Mauna Kea? Which one of those two? Right. And I gotta go through my questions. 
So do you cover a Nobel Prize when you're teaching general chemistry? Do you have a, like, here's today's Nobel Prize in chemistry? Do you ever do no, that? no. It's like, with general chemistry, the trouble with general chemistry is there's so much to cover. I, yeah. I, I don't really have time for, like, you know, a little side yeah, for fun. excavations or anything like that. I mean, I throw in factoids, like, like this sort of stuff. Yeah. But um, I don't have time to sort of give an overview of click chemistry or whatever. Um, <laughs> oh, Susan. Yeah, I want to mountain from base to peak. 100% said, what's the correct answer? Mauna Kea. <laughs> they, they knew it was a trick question. Yeah, the, uh, the, the base of Mauna Kea is the, the, bo the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. So uh, it's got an advantage. So. so it was the wording. It was a meta information reveal. Yeah. They got the information. So yeah. tallest in terms of absolute height is Mount Everest, correct? Um. Yeah. But Mauna Kea has the advantage of the fact that its base is like the bottom of the sea. <laughs> In the ocean. So, yeah. <laughs> they saw right through your ruse. Yeah, yeah. I need to design my questions better, clearly. It's like, you're the king of question design. I, that's why I love this. Like, I, I go back and forth with people on these, and I try to say, you know, make them unexpected. But it's it's hard. It's really hard to write good questions. Right. And it's fun to... One thing I really like about this, I don't know if you saw this, but they're not just saying yes or no. They're betting a certain quantity of their points. Okay. And I'd be really curious to do that on like a Gen Chem exam, like do a like game theory, like mm -hmm. how confident are you in this answer? Bet your yeah. points accordingly. Well, Mauna Kea has a whole lot of interesting things like, you know, it's the favored mountain for telescopes because it is such a tall mountain. Its peak is very flat. It's in an awesome environment, unlike Mount Everest, where you're going to die if you go up there. Um, but there is some controversy because it's considered sacred to the Hawaiian people. Mm. And so they don't want a buttload of telescopes on their, you know, God's, you know, uh, holy mountain. Yeah. So there's some, like, so the, um, you know, the scientists behind the telescopes are now working with the Hawaiian people and figuring out, it's like, maybe instead of building another one, we can take one of the old ones down and, you know, put a new one in place so we don't have to cover this place with telescopes. So there are telescopes there now. It's oh, just a yeah, debate a whole, of how they change. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's one of the most telescope-rich places on Earth. But, mm. I mean, Hawaii, um, the Hawaiians are basically, uh, um, they care about their culture a lot more than um Back in the day, you know, back mm -hmm. in the day when the telescopes were being built, you know, the Hawaiians, nobody listened to them. And, you know, it was like, um, but now they're, you know, everybody, I mean, it's sort of the way people are nowadays. They want their culture maintained and they want, they want their mm -hmm. culture protected. And um, so Hawaii is very protective of their culture. They're trying to, you know, make sure people learn their language and, you know, make sure hula is respected because, I mean, Actually, Hula was banned by the Calvinist ministers who <laughs> were some of the colonizers of Hawaii, and they realized that some of those Hulas were a little frisky and you know, decided to promptly put the band hammer down. Oh, my um, God. Oh, so yeah. Like, the, you know, Hawaiian people are very sex-positive people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some of the some of the hulas are like, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, if you know what I mean. Yeah, like, yeah. This, hula, this song is not actually about a boat rising up and down on the waves. Okay? So... I mean, one of the things when you do hula dancing, you, you have to actually, you you can't just wing it. It's not an interpretive dance. You actually have to understand the words. you got to get them translated. And not only that, you have to have, you have to make sure if there's a secondary frisky meaning, you got to know about it. So um, basically you have to work with Hawaiians or people who understand the culture and can translate. I mean, it's like hula is essentially it's like a sign language yeah you can't because like if there's something in the hula that talks about a place your arms have to be doing this mm. um it's like home sea place so oh, there's certain arm motions that go with certain words so um when you choreograph a hula you basically have to know the words hmm. so it's not like you can just get up there and oh, I'm doing a hula. you know that's disrespectful <laughs> um but yeah so you got to be careful um yeah. yeah, you got to, uh, you know, make sure you're working with people who will understand the culture and the lyrics and stuff like that. And so. this, this is your dive into the, the, the dance, the culture dances. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and it's kind of, it's like, you know, other cultures, they don't care. Yeah. Um, like Middle Eastern is pretty much just wing it. And, you know, it's all about how you're feeling. And, 
you know, you're not interpreting the words, you're just interpreting the emotion. But hula, it's, you know, if they're not actually singing words, you're not supposed to be dancing. Hmm. So there are rules and regulations for hula. And they, you know, they've actually, you know, since the, you know, Calvinist missionaries banned it, the last king of Hawaii basically decided, you know, heck with these colonizers, we're bringing it back. And that was King Kalawa, Kalawa, Kalawa. Um, and they called him the Merry Monarch because he was trying to bring the Hawaiian traditions back. And um, every year in his honor, they have the Merry Monarch Festival, oh, which fun. is a huge hula competition in Hawaii. Best hula dancers on the planet. I mean, these people have been training. Is that it? Um, it's a shorter uh, King Kala. Oh, I should totally know this. I've taken so much hula. Oh, Reese's piece. Reese's uh, piece is on point. Um. Uh, Google Mary Monarch. Mary Monarch. And it's Mary with two R, uh, M E R R I E. Monarch. How do you spell monarch? R E H. There we go. There it is. King Kala. Where is it? Mary Monarch, right there. Oh. The picture it's... side of the Mary Monarch Festival. King David. Kala Kala. Yeah, Kala Kala. There's David the Kala. answer right there. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and these troops are huge. They've been training since they were, since they could walk. They're like mostly native Hawaiian and, you know, it is, you know, they're really proud of their culture and trying to bring it back. And, you know, they're so protective of it that, you know, some people frown on teaching howlies to hula because it's like, this is not theirs. This is ours and stuff like that. But I don't know. Culture should be shared. It could be sh should be shared, and it's a way to learn about other cultures. And I'm not making I'm not making money. I mean, <laughs> there's a whole debate about cultural appropriation, yeah. but you know, I'm not I'm not stealing this culture and trying to make money off of it. I'm, I'm not going to teach it ever. I'm just taking classes. You know, I'm just wanting to learn about the culture and uh, um, yeah. So well, I mean, the other thing about cultural appropriation, all that aside, is just to like. Are you respecting it or are you making fun of it? Yeah, kind of thing. right. Like, are you respecting the traditions and doing it because you're passionate about it or is it a satirical thing? Yeah, so, right, exactly. Yeah, as long as, long as you behave, it's not a big deal. Yeah. Reese's Pieces, I was really hoping Dragon Ball would help me out. <laughs> your Dragon Ball knowledge led you to your answer of <laughs> King Kamahaman. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, but uh, King Kalakawa was actually not the final uh, ruler of Hawaii. It was actually his sister... Queen Liliu. <laughs> so I'll take your word for it. Yeah, yeah but uh, um, she was deposed, and the U.S. took it over. So yeah. So you know, <laughs> sounds about right. Little, That's uh, what we do in the U.S. Yeah, it's a little uh, controversy, and so yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, all right. Legend of Tingle asks a science question. Are the, any of the compounds you make air sensitive? My current experience with inorganic compounds is working with only air sensitive things. Yeah, well, the great thing about like the, the thermoelectric project, those metal silicides we make, totally air stable. Nice. Um, but we have another project where we're growing magnetic materials out of uh, rare earth based fluxes. Um, and most of the rare earths themselves are slightly air sensitive. Mm hmm. And if you grow things out of a very air sensitive flux, chances are they're going to be air sensitive. So a lot of the magnetic materials we grow do have, um, you know, uh, they are air sensitive. So we store them either in a nitrogen flow through or in a, in a glove box. Um, luckily enough, they're, they're stable enough to be handled in air for like, you know, an hour or so. So you can like mount crystals and, you know, you know, Prepare for measurements, but they need to be stored under argon or nitrogen. So, how do you do X-ray diffraction under nitrogen? You just have it in a glass vial. Or... Um, for the compounds we work on, they're they're not air sensitive to the point where you know they're going to burst into flame. So, what we can do is we can cover them, we can coat them with an oil. I see, that's enough. Yeah, and yeah. actually, the um the mounting process for single crystal diffraction is we use this paratone oil, which is essentially it's like a paraffin. Um, except it's liquid at room temperature. It's it's a thick, viscous, honey-like liquid, and it helps the crystals uh, attach to the mounting loop, and it also coats them and keeps them from getting oxidized. So yeah. it's a twofer. It's like makes sense. Yeah. All right, we're nine minutes and fifty nine uh, nine. It's nine fifty right now. Susan, do you want to change up games? Because we still have some Pac-Man to play. 
Uh, sure, Pac-Man. All right. Do, do you want to play God Mode on Frogger for a bit? What's that? <laughs> so there's a game genie code that makes you invincible. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you, we, uh, can, we can freeze time, infinite lives, and don't die. <laughs> Ready, everyone? <laughs> I'll finally make it across. <laughs> no, Yay. Keep going. Keep going. Oh, Show your Jesus mode. <laughs> All right, yes. This is the gameplay you guys all come to ask a science and yes. game. Yes. <laughs> Finally. Oh. oh, it's taking you with it. Ooh, okay. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm really good at this. <laughs> it feels great, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, I remember playing as a kid. My current project essentially has me living in a glove box. That sounds horrible. Yeah. It's like working in space all the time. Space is cool and all, but man. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, we just regenerated our, uh, or replaced our catalyst for the first time in our glove box. Eight years later, that's pretty good. Wow. I mean, we don't use it that much. Okay. It's just once in a while. Most of what we do is just, we can't have oxygen because it quenches phosphorescence. So. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Not any synthesis. <laughs> Not enough photophysics on air sensitive stuff. Yeah. Because it's mm -hmm. hard to measure. I mean, air sensitive in terms of stability, but like oxygen degassing, that's standard for phosphorescence. But yeah, things that decompose, mostly because if they do that, they're not particularly useful for most applications, but yeah, if you can learn things. <laughs> jump Even can the jump wall. in the wall, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is how you need to close your night. Yeah, <laughs> Just me. like I am great at it. <laughs> yeah, awesome, yeah. You know, let's uh, get with that little girl frog. Yeah, uh, how you doing? Any any video game purist, avert your eyes. Susan <laughs> <laughs> is destroying yeah. all the legacy of Frogger. <laughs> yeah, I should look up what the speedrun record of this. I don't even know how many levels there are. But this game is hard. You guys should try it if you haven't. Look up Frogger, find an emulator online. Hey, baby, what's air up? Air sensitive. I mean, the worst part, especially with photophysics with air sensitive things, is if it turns into something that emits differently. Like you change your properties, your dynamics, all of it. Just destroyed over time. Very frustrating part. All right, we should do another prediction unless you want to switch over to Pac Man. Oh. Let's do another prediction. I right. like this cotton mode. <laughs> it's your vengeance on the system. <laughs> uh, oh, I luckily found a cuvette that keeps it airtight. Yeah, depending on how air sensitive, like those septa, those screw cap septa where you can inject a syringe, those go bad after one injection, which, again, really? depending on how sensitive it is. Shout out to sketchy websites. Yes, there aren't legitimate websites where you can emulate because people own these games, but... There's some good, illegitimate websites out there. All right, Susan, which prediction you want to do? I would say this one. It's probably a. Well, they're solely. <laughs> they're probably going to figure that out. <laughs> one of these. What do you want? Now let's do a Susan question. We had one earlier about what sport Susan does, and it was mixed response on that one. Yeah, that was the one they did. They didn't guess properly. Yeah. Hey. yeah. All right, we got another prediction up there. If you're not following us, click the follow button, especially since we're only five followers away from 500, actually. So we have a milestone coming up. So if there are five people in the chat not following, follow us right now. We'll get to that 500 number. It'll also give you 300 standard internet units that you can bet on the question, how many countries has Susan lived in? Is the answer two or three? We know for sure the answer is at least one because Susan currently lives in Florida in the United States. But the question is, how many states has she lived in? Two or, th or how many countries has she lived in? If you want to you know, count Florida as its own special weird fiefdom. <laughs> We won't for the sake yeah, of this we're, we're question, gonna keep, we're, we're gonna we con could. <laughs> consider Florida as part of the United States for now. Oh, for now. Yeah, right, we'll see what happens next. Bugs Bunny election. sawing off the peninsula. You've seen that little meme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll see what the next hurricanes, how it's going to go. Yeah. Florida life. <laughs> anyway, don't get me wrong. I love Tallahassee, but Florida as a whole. Yeah, is, it's weird. It's, it's very weird. Florida man is real. Yeah. If you guys have a prediction or have a, have a idea how many countries has Susan lived in, what have you learned about her Frogger gameplay that tells you how many countries she's lived in? <laughs> Throw your prediction there right now. I don't think you can Google this one, but feel free to. Well, maybe. No. No, that would, no social media is going to reveal. Nah. 
I mean, you say that, but how much do they actually know in terms of data mining and number of tweets and comments and CV? Like, I don't know, but Elon Musk is going to own Twitter, I guess. So. Oh, my God. Yeah. I'm sure this will result fine. Yeah. It was originally, there was a proposal to make people pay per tweet or something, you know, like 10 cents per tweet. Or, yeah, that was crazy. Mm. No, it was in Bitcoin was what he oh, what for, I heard. Wow. Yep. <sighs> I mean, I'm not huge on Twitter. We, we have a reasonable following and a reasonable audience, but... And we'll see what happens. All right, Susan, what's the answer? Two or three? Three. Three. What three countries? U.S., Austria, Germany. Austria and Germany. Ooh, that's that's fun. Yeah. They're close, but they're different countries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so congratulations to those of you that said three. Oh, you got a 2.84 to one payout. So yeah, again, this one was a balanced one. Mm -hmm. so not too bad. So congratulations to those of you that said three, Austria, Germany, and the United States. Mm -hmm. So that was, when did you live there? Um, well, my dad was in the military when I was young, so mm. we lived in Germany. And, and it's like, does that really count as Germany if you're living on a military base? Because technically it's U.S. soil, but, you know, I count it as Germany. I mean, you went grocery shopping in yes, Germany, exactly. right? Yeah. Well, we, we count that. Although, you know, the base had the PX on it, so, you know. You so you could speak German? Um, I didn't learn how to speak Germany, German until I moved to Austria. Because, huh. you know, when I was in Germany, it was, you know, geez, I think I was like four or five. Oh, I see. Pretty young. Um, but then my dad retired from the military and worked for the UN in Austria. And, you know, when you're not living in an army base, you have to, you know, learn German. Um, I went to an American-speaking school, but you... you become fluent in German if you're there for like five years, which mm -hmm. I was. So um, I used to be pretty fluent in German, but now I can, I can understand it if it's spoken slowly. Yeah. Um, but if it's, you know, rapid fire, uh, I, I get lost. And um, is in your office next to Ollie? No, he's on. It's the next floor. to Lee. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I've got a German speaker. Next <laughs> yeah. Here. No, you could practice. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it is kind of lucky that uh, I do speak a spattering German still. Cause um Solid state chemistry, Germany, classic. Germany is a powerhouse in solid state chemistry. Yeah. So a lot of the classic papers are in German and um, I'm able to understand them. Although the weird thing is, you know, uh, the names of the elements, you know, they have different words for the elements. Mm -hmm. And that's not something you learn in a German class. You know, they don't teach you that Schwefel is sulfur and, you know, Eisen is iron and Stickstoff is nitrogen. So <laughs> for that, you know, I have to, you know, I got my little German periodic table up on the wall. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's fun. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the publications, early ones especially, were in German. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, there was a debate in, was it the 50s or 60s, what should be the language of science? Huh. And it was... Yeah. It was must have been earlier than that, but yeah, Germany, German or English, <laughs> Frogger walk. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> All right, so congratulations, anyone that said three again. There's your winner: Austria, Germany, and the United States. Yeah. Of course, that gives away the answer to that one. So. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll cancel that one out. Yeah. Although it's kind of interesting. It's like. Um, <laughs> That was, you know, I, I joke that uh, that was one of the reasons I got interested in molten metal. It's a, the question was like, um, there's a process of div divination using molten metal, which is traditional in Austria, Germany, and Germanic countries. It's like a New Year's thing. Mm. Um, it's called molybdomancy, <laughs> um, as opposed to like necromancy and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah. and what they do is, uh, you know, at, um, on at New Year's, what you do is you. Uh, you take a piece of metal, you melt it, and then you dump it in water, and the metal will, you know, the molten metal will immediately freeze when it hits the cold water. And the shape of the frozen metal is supposed to tell you something about your future. Huh. So I actually, you know, when I was living in Austria, I was um, through age nine, it, it, age nine through, through age fourteen. Uh -huh. um, I went to a New Year's party, and they were doing that. And you know, the divination was some. BS, but I thought the molten metal was cool. What metal were they using? Um, it's they used to use lead, but now they use tin because okay. you know, lead. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, they definitely wouldn't use molybdenum because I mean that's it take a lot, a lot to make to melt molybdenum. 
but yeah, the Latin name is molybdenancy. Who needs tin, like tea leaves when you got metal? Exactly, <laughs> like what exactly, the hell? Yeah. I didn't know that was a thing. That's awesome. That's yeah. that or, originates out of Austria and Germany. Yeah, That's really it's really fun. It's a tradition in, you know, Austria, Germany, Switzerland, Finland. Yeah. Yeah. So that area. But uh yeah. So uh I like it. Yeah, I like the molten metal. And so maybe that that maybe that's what's what attracted me to to I mean, that would make some fun Twitter photos. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Ollie might be into that because there's like a certain amount of chaos theory and, you know, like and freezing yeah. chunks of metal. <laughs> yeah. Growth rates and structure forming. And, huh. Yeah. It's pretty fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> You're still getting the satisfaction out of God mode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. No, there's something we said. You've earned it, though. Earned, like an hour of stuff. I could or, not yeah. through that past that level. Sorry. Nope. I don't even know how many levels are in this. Is, is this game beatable? That's a good question. There's some playthrough videos. I'm not going to go through the entirety of. I want to see how far they go, though. Say the level somewhere. It's level three. Sure, this is very slow as well. I'll have to look up the speed run at some point. Yeah, so when Eugene was on here, he did a speed run, right? <laughs> yeah, he did uh, Mario 2, Crazy. the US version of Mario 2. Huh. It was okay. It was not an optimized speedrun. So in uh, a month from now, I am the guest on Ask a Scientist Gaming. Huh. And so the reason is we're doing our Q&A about graduate admissions. Hmm. And I'm the chair of GRAC this semester. Right. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to try to do some NARC speedruns <laughs> during the stream. Because why not? Yeah. It's just for fun. You know, get it on record. Maybe I can break a record. Hmm. <laughs> but yeah, Eugene and I actually started speedrunning Mario as like a joke, and then it became serious, and now yeah, I have several games I've speedrun. So this is going to spark something in you, Susan, where you're just going to like video game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is your new uh, hobby. So. <laughs> like uh, Frogger. Uh, you're going to uh, commit to, to Frogger life. Let's, let's see what the record is. There are many different versions of Frogger. It's a level five. Wow, the record is eight minutes and 19 seconds. Jeez. That is impressive. I don't understand how he got past that level. The buses. Mm -mm. Oh, you might have actually beaten it already. So there's level eight, and then it. So that that like exclamation point there. Mm -hmm. That's supposed to say level. So if you beat level eight, yep. So you've already beaten the game. Hmm. Congratulations. I don't know how long it took. We can look back at the video footage uh, <laughs> and calculate it. <laughs> yeah, I cheated the game. Yeah. Like that. Uh, this is level six. See, I don't even know. But I think you've you passed through them already. Like you're on level fourteen, but oh. it doesn't go past eight or something like that. <laughs> Again, video game purists, avert your eyes. We are cheating the entire night away. Yeah. <laughs> well, apparently that's the thing to do. Is uh, you know, look at the chess world, oh the fishing my God. world. Did you hear about the fish oh, and the chess? The weights that he put the, in the that? weights and the fish. Yeah. Like I was looking at that and I was like, oh, that's kind of ridiculous. But then it, when you hear the backstory, people are angry. That dude won three hundred thousand dollars last year. Really? Fishing. Yes. No. Like he was a sponsored professional fisherman. Oh, like it was not a like that's lawsuit country. That's not just I have a bigger fish. That's Eesh. that's fraud, man. which is crazy. And the chess world apparently <laughs> all sorts of fascinating ways to cheat that I'm not going to mention well, well, here. Claims about how to cheat. Yeah. I, somebody just made that up. I don't mm -hmm. know. Like yeah, I. 
I don't know. But there was a there was a press release today from chess.com that basically did an analysis and said that dude was cheating in over a hundred professional games yeah, or something like that. Crazy. Yeah. It's intense. It's <laughs> you've been reading into the chess drama. Mm. Who knew chess was so exciting? Like Twitch blew up chess over the last couple of years, which is crazy. Huh. And then Magnus Carlsen, obviously like a rock star in the has had quite chess. enough. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so good on them for like bringing it back, chess mm. back into fame and popularity. Mm. <laughs> I got into chess a couple of years ago because of YouTube. Absolutely. <laughs> Chess is one of those things I wrestle with because, like, a computer can beat the best chess players in the world 100% of the time. Really? Yep. So, like, you look at the rating system. I don't know what the point system, but I saw this this today that essentially Magnus Carlsen has a ranking of 2,800. The best computer software has a ranking of 3,500. And then if you do this, the, like, calculations on the success rate, uh, he will never tie the best computer in chess. Man, Skynet has become sentient. No, like, absolutely. You know. and, and they're they're claiming cheating now just based on the types of moves that a computer would do versus a human, which wow. is kind of crazy. That's how chess.com analyzed those games and said, there's a likelihood he was cheating on this number of games, which wow. is crazy. Like, but I'm like, why don't humans do computer moves then? <laughs> like, <laughs> get better at being like a computer. Wow. Because they make moves that just humans wouldn't based on history of studying games. But who knows? Great job. You wrap the levels. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's it. So that's that's because the, the actual criteria was like one wrap or something like huh. that. So you've done your second wrap up through all the levels. And now you're starting over at level one, probably. So, yeah, you beat mm. it. Wow. Huh. All right, you want a Pac-Man for a little bit? Sure. All right, we're going to jump to some Pac-Man for the NES. Back to the original NES. Pac-Man, one of the all-time classics. All right, and this was another arcade game that you played. There's, there's actually a, I don't know if you know about this, there's an arcade in Railroad Square Park that has all these retro games, which is hmm. kind of fun. Go in there once in a while and play on uh, first Friday type nights. All right, so I'm going to ask one of our standard questions we ask of every guest. Um, so I've watched a shitload of movies because my wife and I have been cord cutters for over 15 years. So we've been on Netflix and all the movie streaming sites. But one of the big ones for us is, you know, what movie or TV show gets your discipline right and what gets it wrong? Then mm. discipline broadly defined. I don't think anyone's done a movie about flux synthesis yet, as far right. as I know. But well, I mean, I guess the crime, you know, CSI, CSI yeah, yeah. And NCIS and all that stuff with the labs and um, yeah, that, sometimes they get it right. That that offends every chemist, though. Really? <laughs> Some of them, well, when they get it wrong, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, the mass spec where the molecule just appears on the screen. Yeah. Well, it doesn't <laughs> like work that that way, would be yeah. so glorious if it did. Yeah. It would solve so many problems. Healing crystals, magnetic crystals. So CSI gets it right sometimes, but also wrong sometimes. Yeah. Oh, boy, I think I'm dead. Your, your hours of Cupid have trained you for this. <laughs> uh, oh, shit. <laughs> Pac-Man oh, yeah. is one of the most high-stress games yeah. that exist. <laughs> like, those of you that haven't played it, I strongly recommend it because it is amazingly fun to play some, <laughs> some quality Pac-Man. But anyway, if you're just joining us, it's 10 o'clock. We've been here for two hours. Ask a Scientist Gaming, Mediocre Gameplay, Expert Science. Our guest today is Dr. Susan Will Turner, who is an expert in inorganic synthesis, X-ray crystallography, growing crystals, crystal properties, uh, magnetic materials, metal stable states. She grows crystals inside of metal fluxes, which which means basically you you melt metals and use that as the solution to do your reactions, which is kind of crazy. Uh, she's also an editor for Inorganic Chemistry. So if you guys have any questions for Susan, throw them in chat. We are happy to answer those while she has a, while she has a journey through Pac-Man. So this is another arcade classic you've played at some point. It's hard with this thing. 
So are you familiar with the, uh, the controversy regarding Billy Mitchell, the first person to beat Pac-Man? <laughs> so Billy Mitchell was the first person to do a perfect game of Pac-Man, which means basically you do 300 levels where you get every single fruit and eat every single ghost with the specials. And then you get to a level that's basically broken. It's called a kill screen where the game can't process information anymore. But he did a perfect game of Pac-Man back in the day. But recently it was revealed he was cheating on some of his record scores. He submitted things that couldn't possibly be happening. And yeah, it's a huge uproar in the um, yeah the speed running in the video game record community. So yeah, fishing, chess, and <laughs> Pac-Man and Donkey Kong and whatnot. <laughs> He's still meme. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right, let me change his name. Man, he's a character. Have you ever seen the movie uh, King of Kong, Fistful of Quarters? Mm -mm. I absolutely recommend it. If you're going to watch any documentary on video games of any kind, King of Kong, Fistful of Quarters is a documentary about chasing the world record score in Donkey Kong. And this came out like, what was it, 10 years ago? Something like that. But it is the most amazing storytelling you will ever see in a documentary. Like, the, the good guys and the bad guys are just almost caricatures of what a character should be. So, I strongly recommend. I don't know what streaming service is on, but maybe you have it. Mm. King of Kong, Fistful of Quarters. Fistful of Quarters, that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a great name. Yeah. <laughs> uh... All right, so we answered the, the movie and TV show. CSI is the most offensive one, but also gets it right sometimes. Yeah. Is there anything else that comes to mind? Uh, let's see here. Chemistry. I mean, some of the other, like, you know, police procedurals that have labs, like uh, CSI. I know, not CSI, the, like NCIS or something mm -hmm. with the Navy lab. Um, yeah. Sometimes they get it right, but... Their lab person is a little too quirky for my taste. It's like, we get it, you're cute and extra, whatever. Um, <laughs> you're offended by the character more than the science. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no, that's fair. Um, but, yeah, it's like, you know, not a whole lot of chemists outside, you know, police procedurals, really. I mean, where else do we see chemistry being done? Yeah. There's a Marie Curie movie fair, fairly recently. I don't know if you saw that one. Uh, Rosamund Pike played Marie Curie. Huh. So yeah, that was an interesting one. I don't know if I liked it, but yeah, at least it captured the story to some degree. Mm -hmm. ah. All right. Let me see if I can leave you with one more question while I run to the restroom. Um, but what's what is your I made it moment as a scientist? Like, I'm an amateur scientist and all of a sudden I made it to the big leagues. Do you have a moment like that? If so, what is that moment? I guess the first time I published uh, a paper from my own lab where I was like the last author. Because, you know, authorship... The first author is the person who does the work in the lab. The last author is the person who, you know, comes up with the ideas, organizes the thinking, comes up with the funding. So, you know, if you get published, you know, a published paper where you're the last author, that means you're running a successful research group and, you know, you got it published, which means you got the, you know, approval of your peers and your science is, you know, worth reading. So, oh, I'm dead. Shoot. Um, so that's sort of a, you know, a validation moment when you first have that, you know, that first publication from your own research group. Um, because, I mean, you know, when you're a graduate student, you know, pu publications, um, you know, that's also validating because, you know, that's, that's your work that you did in lab. But, you know, when you're running a research group, to know that, you know, you've got a publication and you're the last author and it was accepted in a journal and published and, you know, that's validating. Or maybe, like, you know, when you when you get your first funding, you know, your first uh, successful, successful grant proposal, mm -hmm. um, that's another validating moment. 
you know, it really is. And those things are, they're community based, right? They're, they're peer review they're yeah. by experts in your field. And they said, yes, this person is either worth money or worth publishing their paper. Mm -hmm. That is very validating. Yeah. But man, it takes a long time to get good at writing a paper. And like, yeah. It's, it's hard. So how's Pac-Man treating you? I'm still a little shaky on these little controllers, but... Yeah. <laughs> so I ask you at a time, I'm like, keyboard, <laughs> controller, or joystick, and you're like, whatever. Yeah, I didn't know what you <laughs> had. I, oh, I could have made all of them work, but oh, I, I defaulted to controller because it's easier, but <laughs> next time, I promise, we'll do a joystick of some kind. Uh -huh. Look at the arcade classics. We'll go after another one. All right, so we have, what, 45 minutes left, and we have two predictions left. Do you want to put one of these up? Sure. Which one? Uh, um. All right. This one's near and dear to my heart. I don't know if you've heard about my diatribe about diamonds. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you, you chose the right person to be asking this question. But... Yeah. All right, we have a diamonds question. All right, so we got another prediction. Anyone that's not following, click the follow button, get your standard internet units. Answer the question, do diamonds last forever, yes or no? Or will they last forever? <laughs> we got an immediate no to that answer. <laughs> uh, is there anything you want to add to this question? Um... Based on thermodynamics, we'll say. Yeah. We don't get to measure forever. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Yeah, but yeah, if you guys have any questions for Susan, throw them in chat. She's happy to answer them. We got 45 minutes. Huggy Beer, welcome back. Good evening. Came in strong with the prediction. Welcome back. If you have questions for Susan, she's happy to answer them. She grows crystals in molten metal, which means she heats up metals until they melt and then grows crystals in that, which lets you access really unique environments to do reactions. Like there's only so many things you can do, waters and liquid solvents. You can do unique crystal structures and metastable states and all sorts of things that are uncomfortable in other conditions grow inside of molten metals, which is kind of cool, mm -hmm. um, but really hard too. I mean, what percentage of your crystal growth, like you go into it expecting one thing? How often do you get that thing? Um, well, once we, I mean, quite often, you know, we know what elements we want to, to go into our product. Mm -hmm. Like if we know we want to make a metal psilocyde, we can, you know, adjust our parameters. So we're probably going to get something that is a metal psilocyde. We don't necessarily know what ratios they're going to contain. We, we don't know which elements are going to be at what ratios or what positions. Um, and that's the, you know, me being jealous of organic chemistry. They have that kind of control. They can control exactly where, where this functional group is going to wind up. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have that kind of control. I would like that kind of control. So, you know, one of the things we're trying to do is sort of develop a database. So, you know, as we change, you know, one parameter, as we change like the, the, the content or the stoichiometry of the reaction, do we get a way to control, um, the compounds that we come, uh, that come out? So, you know, that's one of the things that we're trying to sort of develop an understanding of. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, is there a high throughput screening way to do what you guys do? Um, not really. Yeah. Something like a, um, like a reaction it's, well it's a, or something or yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, Simex would, uh, do you remember Simex, the, the company, the no, combinatorial chemistry company that would basically, um, this was like in the early days of combinatorial chemistry where they would basically use thin film. They, they would deposit a thin film and a gradient of different elements mm -hmm. and, you know, basically map out a grid of oh, like what, what compounds formed from these different stoichiometries. Yeah. And they could also take that, you know, you know, since it was thin film, they could like do measurements on each section of the film, mm. measure properties and stuff like that. But we don't have thin films. We have like containers of excess liquid. Yeah. So there's no way to sort of do that in a combinatorial way. 
I mean, so could you make a well or something like that? Like a multi-well plate or something and do reaction? I guess... Man, that's so hard. Yeah, it's hard <laughs> it's to design that. liquid metals. Molten things are squishy. Are you creating pe pressures to start your crystals? I think it's just temperature, right? Yeah, it's just temperature and you hit a solubility threshold and you get a precipitate. Yeah. It's just like salt water. When you cool it down, you'll grow crystals. Yeah. You exactly. can do the same thing inside of molten metals, which is kind of crazy. Just need a crystal growth event. Mm. All right, Susan, what's the answer? Do diamonds last forever? No. The answer is no. Absolutely not. The delta G is what, three kilojoules per it's mole or something like small. that? The it's difference, very small. Yeah, the difference between graphite and diamond is, is very small, but graphite is the more stable allotrope. So given, you know, millions of years, diamonds will eventually convert to graphite. Um, of course, it's faster if you help things along a little. But, um, yeah, so diamonds do not last forever. <laughs> oh, Elio, you're right. Ken absolutely loves the diamond industry. Presumably that's one of my students. Uh, well, every fifth review I get from general chemistry is me ranting about the diamond industry. <laughs> <laughs> one of them this last cycle is something about my mom is angry at me because she thinks her rings turn turning into graphite. I'm like, <laughs> Technically, that's true. So uh -huh. I have zero remorse. But yeah, it's 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 a running theme in my class. Uh, I should tell her this fact? Absolutely. My wife wouldn't let me propose to her with graphite. No, if you're gonna get a if you're gonna get a ring for marriage, I've been married 15 years and I refuse to get a ring just because I don't need that for validation of any kind. <laughs> but if you're gonna get a ring, get something that's actually rare and precious. Like diamonds are neither of those things. De Beers just artificially makes them that way. You can get one out of like meteorite or you know iridium or <laughs> you know dinosaur bone or something that's actually rare and precious and interesting because diamonds aren't cutting it. It's just a marketing scheme. But anyway, <laughs> Legend of Tingle, you probably didn't hear my rant, but you should at some point. I got to record it and put it up on YouTube because you screw the diamond industry and all they stand for. <laughs> but yeah, diamonds are not forever, which I'm really glad you asked that question because, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's brainwashed. It's so brilliant. They yeah. just like stormed in in the 1930s and 40s and just took over name brand recognition. Just invented the whole engagement ring thing. It used to just be like a wedding ring. Yeah. That's the standard thing. But yeah, now yeah. the engagement ring, you got to pay X, X months of salary and stuff like that. It's it's all invented. It's crazy. Like the, the original symbol, and I looked up all this history when I was first looking into it. It's like the original ring was to represent this closed circle of, you know, intimacy or, you know, shared ex life experience that closes the loop. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it's like it has to be made out of gold and then you mm -hmm. have to attach a diamond and it's just complete and total bullshit yeah <laughs> we also love stress ring marketing oh man that is definitely one of my students from gen chem so they may might not learn anything else in my gen chem class <laughs> but they will know diamond rings are a scam uh healing crystals are bullshit <laughs> stress rings don't do anything yeah <laughs> I'll count all those things as victories. They mm. actually have practical implications and affect people's lives. So it's it's a joke that I say, but also I'm very serious about. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, you don't have to spend two months' salary, sorry. Yeah, they just made up that number. How yeah. crazy is that? Mm -hmm. Like, you guys should spend two months' salary on Ask a Scientist Gaming subscriptions. <laughs> I yeah. just made that up. Or, like, down payment on a house. Something yeah, yeah. like that, you know? I don't understand the whole, like wedding wedding industry it's like the it's crazy, people isn't it? weddings are like so expensive these days i can't freaking believe it yeah yeah yeah, no, yeah. my my wife and i have been anti-traditionalists we got married for 500 dollars, and most oh, of that was for the legal fees <laughs> of just like paperwork and the logistic aspects of it so yeah i'm 100 percent behind that <laughs> oh leo a proud 8 a.m. student. Well, kudos to you, because we had class at 8 a.m. this morning, and you're still up hanging out. Wow. <laughs> if you have any questions for Susan, throw those in chat. She'd be happy to talk about healing crystals and how structure impacts healing. The answer is it doesn't. Unless you eat it, then uh, maybe it would. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can beat you on the, you know, horrible morning thing tomorrow when I have a oh, root my canal. God. Yeah. Like it actually starts at 7.30? 7.30, yeah. Yeah, so...
And this was, it's actually, it's not a new, new root canal, it's fixing an old root canal. Mm. You know, I got it like 20 years ago in Michigan when I was a postdoc, and it's, I'm feeling some pain now, because, I don't know, it wasn't, you know, something's inflamed, so. Yeah. I mean, but the technology, I imagine, has progressed a lot since then. Oh, well, I like hope so. Just like materials, the compass, you hope so. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, I, uh, here's a shot of vodka. <laughs> like, no, no, this exactly. bag. <laughs> Good luck, <Susan>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the worst part of it for me is going to be the, the Novocaine or whatever, because I freaking hate getting shots. Oh, yeah, the needle's pretty brutal on those, too. Well, no, it's, 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 it's not, actually not. It's pretty small. But, you know, I'm, I'm actually hoping that the uh, one decent thing the COVID thing did was it got me kind of used to needles. Because, mm, you know, yeah. you, know, you got to get those boosters, shots. And, yeah. yeah. It was either that or the fact that, you know... My cat that passed away last year, she had a diabetes, so I had to give her like insulin shots. Oh wow! In the neck, the yeah, with the little uh, that yeah, box. yeah. <sighs> and I felt so bad, but you know, it, it's in the part of the neck where they got like extra skin and stuff, so I don't feel it, but it, it's more painful for me than it is for her because it's my baby. Man, I wrestle around with that a lot with pets. Sorry, sorry to de detour on this, but it's mm -hmm. like, like if your cat gets cancer, do you treat it? Because it has no idea what's going on and why it feels like shit all the time. Because you're like doing chemotherapy on a cat. I just... I, yeah, well, diabetes is, you know, insulin management is, is, you know, relatively well understood. So yeah, yeah. I was okay with doing that. Yeah, that would make sense, but... It's like, if it goes that far, when you make decisions and, yeah, because we have two cats and oh, well. they're fairly old. Where they're are they? Nine and 10 years old. One's usually up on the cat stand in here, but I kick her out during this. So she doesn't meow during <laughs> Ask a Scientist Gaming. We might see him on the way out. No, I actually got uh, adopted a couple new cats uh, recently, like last month. Oh, wow. Young yeah. ones or? Um, uh, one of them's two years old and one of them's a four month old kitten. Actually, oh, uh, wow. if you look at the questions, yeah. Uh, where's that? Uh, where's the, oh, is the, the other type of thing? Like factoids? It, yeah. Uh oh, somebody request a factoid right now. Spend your internet units that you <laughs> just want on the questions. Susan yeah, yeah. needs a factoid answered. Because yeah, one of them concerns my cats. <laughs> I want to talk about my cats, so ask. Susan wants to spend your internet points. I mean, we can do it anyway. I can request because I haven't been internet points. But you guys don't use them for anything, so you might as well request a factoid from mm -hmm. Susan. <laughs> I'll give you a redeemed request a factoid. Susan, drop your knowledge bomb. Okay. 80% um, of all orange tabbies are male. So if you see an orange tabby cat, 80% of the time it's going to be a male. And that's because the orange gene is on the X chromosome. Um, and males only have one of those, so if that X chromosome is, you know, has the orange gene, they're going to be orange. Females have two X chromosomes, and they need both of those chromosomes to have the orange gene in order to express orangeness. That's so fun. that's why female orange tabbies are only 20% of all the orange tabbies, and one of my cats is an orange tabby who's female. So 20 percenter. <laughs> Wait, did you know this before or after you adopted this cat? I knew it before, yeah. Because I used to have, like, a, one of my first cats was a, a male orange tabby, so. So, again, most male, t male or most orange tabby cats that you see are going to be male, 80%. Hmm. Yeah, so that's Mia, the orange tabby female. And then the, the kitten, um, he's four months old, and he has a name that, like, it's his name the shelter gave him, and I decided to keep it. It doesn't, it's like, this is a, a little squeaky, playful male kitten, mm -hmm. and the name is just the opposite of that. Like, what, what is the diametric opposite of squeaky, playful? I'm going to go with little... Hitler. Is it Hitler? No. <laughs> it, not, it, uh, too far. <laughs> too far, too far. Anyone have guesses in chat? Throw them in chat. Yeah, well, uh, what is the weirdest name you could give a tiny adorable fluffy squeaky playful male kitten <laughs> the weirdest not, name not like the, hitler the diametrically op <laughs> opposite name uh tingle thank you for stopping by always a pleasure to have you on stream join us again in two weeks it'll be mike roper's back this time in person he's gonna talk about microfluidics and analytics and lab on a chip technology and then two weeks after that i'm actually the guest we're gonna do our q a about graduate admissions so yeah come back in a couple weeks or send me an email obviously mr t is that the answer <laughs> 
I am the Dark Knight. I am vengeance. <laughs> oh, it is. It's Batman? <laughs> That's the name the shelter gave him, and he's like a tiny little squeaky... He, he doesn't meow, he just goes... <laughs> Like, how are you, Batman? Batman doesn't, you know, squeak. It's like, Ugh. Dry Bones Taco. Mm. <laughs> you should go with Taco. Yeah. It's but, you not, know. You could change its name if you wanted to. Yeah, I was thinking about it, but then I remember, like, before they went all grimdark with Batman, yeah. he was played by Adam West in the old, you know. No, the, that's true. So, and you know. Michael Keaton. He used, he used to be kind of goofy, so. Mm -hmm. I just cannot get these last dots. Yeah, they've definitely Earth. taken a dark turn with Batman characters. Yeah, that's for yeah. sure. Sign of the times. Huggy Bear, thank you for requesting the factoid. Susan was really excited to share that factoid about her recent cats. Yeah. That's fun. Ugh. Statistics. That's just like <laughs> Mendel so. and squares. Yeah, it's just and, Jeanette Punnett yeah. squares. Yeah, Punnett yeah, remember squares, that? Yeah. yeah. Yep. So, oh. That is fun. Not okay, Huggy to Bear, I'm going to get back to your question. Sorry if I missed it earlier, but the fun metal crystals, have they made their way into anything commercial at this point? Um, not, not, not yet. Um, if anything, I think, you know, the most likely to eventually be commercialized would be some of the metal silicides because they are air stable. Silicon is dirt cheap. Um, and if we can get them to have properties that are comparable to the metal tellurides, that would be awesome. But wait, the thermoelectrics, those aren't, those don't count. Yeah. They, these are the thermoelectrics, okay. the metal cell sides. Yeah. 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 But those aren't, those are commercially available, aren't they? Um, my compounds aren't. Okay. Um, yeah, yours aren't. Okay. But yeah, so thermoelectric modules are commercially made. They're found in things like, uh, um, well, you know, the most, uh, uh, um, out there application is in deep space probes because well, once you're fun. yeah once you're far enough away from the sun solar panels aren't getting you, aren't, aren't getting you anything so yeah their their power supply is basically uh, they have a heat source and a thermoelectric module and then the coldness of space is the cold source and so that temperature gradient causes the thermoelectric module to create a voltage and that's what that's what's powering all those deep space probes like Cassini and the Pluto the Pluto the ones that looked at Pluto. Mm -hmm. The heat source. Guess what the heat source is? <laughs> I know the answer. Anyone in chat. But it's 1030, so we should transition to NARC. Susan, are you ready for this? Sure. We're going to close the night by winning the war on drugs, as usual. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is time to beat Mr. Big and win at NARC. Oh, man. So, yeah, press start, walk right, <laughs> find doors. Note that we do have a timer for this. Do you want to see the timer or not? It's up to you. <laughs> this one has music in it, huh? Ooh, Huggy Bear has a follow up of thermoelectrics. How much of a heat gradient do you need to create electricity? Um, the bigger the heat gradient, the more volts you get. Oh, um, is it? It's it's that's it's that straightforward. Yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah. I guess that makes sense. Huh. So if you've got the coldness of space on one side and decaying plutonium dioxide on the other, um, that is going to create a nice big temperature gradient, and uh, that's what they do for the deep space probes. <laughs> and the Martian got this right. The movie The Martian. Oh yeah, you, that's you a talked good one. about the, yeah, the, the yeah. thermal uh, the. Radio, the RTG, the radioisotope thermoelectric generator. Mm -hmm. That is what they would use on Mars. Um, it just has a big old chunk of plutonium dioxide in the middle of it, generating heat just from natural radiated decay. And then Mars is pretty cold, and uh, so that's your temperature gradient. And uh, um, yeah, so give me that. Give me that. How oh, I pick this up? Yeah, it's it's touchy. Okay. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Why am I flickering? Um, yeah, so I did like that part of um, the, Martian. the Martian. I guess they did like actual research into that because that captured the science pretty well. Yeah. Like even the physics. I mean, aside from the the unlikelihood of <laughs> shooting at no spoilers, I'm not going to give anything yeah. away. But <laughs> so it goes. <laughs> Susan has two factoids left and a prediction. What do you want to do? You want to do a do the last prediction? 
that one up there? Sure. All right. We got one more science question for you guys. Ask a scientist honor code. Do not look up the answer. See what if you know this off the top of your head. This is related to one of your factoids, actually. Which is kind of fun, so we'll transition to that one next. All right, science question. If you're not following us, click the follow button, get your standard internet units, and answer this question. Which is more abundant than the Earth's crust? Is the answer silicon or aluminum? With many elements in our Earth's crust are on Earth, period. Uh, the question is, which one's more abundant than the Earth's crust? Is it silicon or is it aluminum? Huggy Bear, RTGs aren't feasible here on Earth. Is that correct? Right. Um, on Earth, the uh, um, they would use other heat sources. Like, for instance, um, I think BMW was trying to harness some of the waste heat from its engines by putting in a thermal thermal electric module. Mm -hmm. So they would put that right near their engine. Their engine's just generating heat naturally, and the thermal electric module would be used to like run the radio or something like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, so you know that's one of the ways that you can try and harvest all that waste heat because like 60% it's like if you got your coal burning power plant 60% of all that energy is going off as heat so can we put a thermal electric module on there that's gonna you know use that heat to generate a thermal gradient and therefore generate a voltage so um yeah. I mean what's interesting about that is presumably that's more effective if you're in colder climates than if you're in warmer climates, right? Because you're using atmospheric cool yeah. on the other side of that gradient. Right. <laughs> oh, we're in the chemistry lab here, the, the meth lab. The meth lab. So that's Blackstop. Dr. Hypo something or other. I don't remember his name, but yeah. He makes heroin and shoots needles at you. Jeez. You know, the free drugs we were always promised in, <laughs> oh, in Dare. All right, so this one you have to hold A and shoot the, the guys wearing black at relatively close range, and one's going to drop a blue card. So if you hold down A button, yep. You will shoot one of them, and they will randomly drop a blue card. All right, so hold it down. So that was a tap. If you hold it down, you get bullets. Oh, <laughs> and there's the dog. There's the dog. So the premise will work just using different sources, yeah, and I imagine the efficiency will be dramatically different because the temperature gradient is lower, but yeah, thermal electrics are used. That's it's not an uncommon thing. Mm -hmm. I think that's what they use for the for the solar thermal, right? To turn, convert heat into electricity. Because um, they store it in a liquid. Like a molten salt or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they use that gradient to generate electricity. I think that's how they do it. So if you hold down both buttons, and then point towards the dog, <laughs> you know, the drug dealer dog. This dog is... Oh no, it's, it's ruthless. Yeah. Yeah, just hold down both the red buttons, and then face the other way. There you go. Oh, he turned into a puppy, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Gender unknown. <laughs> Not have you related, Mendel. Where's my blue save card? What else do we have for questions? Oh, this is a fun one. What's your favorite equation? Negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4c over 2a. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I was able to memorize, you know, I memorized that in sixth grade because uh, two people, you know, I, I had a competition with two of the guys in my class about who could say it the fastest. Ah, uh, I see. That's one way of, like, memorizing stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, you trained in competition-based learning. <laughs> I like it. Yep. So that stuck with you since then. So yeah, you want to hold this trigger button, this one, just mm -hmm. hold it down and walk around and murder things. Wow, okay. <laughs> yes, you're murdering drug dealers, stealing their money and their drugs, and eventually one of them, the guys that wear black, will drop a blue card. There you go, there it is. Then that one, go up to the door, and then you're good. Uh-oh. Yeah, thermoelectrics. All right, Susan, what is the answer? What's the most abundant element in our Earth's crust? Is the answer silicon or aluminum? Well, I should specify um, of those two elements, of those, of two, those two elements, the most abundant is silicon. Silicon. Because there is a whole lot of 
Wow. Uh, silicate minerals. All right. That one flipped it hard. Yeah. Well, that's why we're interested in making metal silicides, because silicon's so abundant. Huggy um, Pear just got a 41 to 1 payout with that question. Silicon okay. is the answer. I mean, that's, yeah. that's dirt. Right? Yeah, the band is SiO2. Um, a lot of the minerals on the Earth, in the Earth's crust are metal silicates. Um, so silicon is extremely common in the Earth's crust. Um, once you go deeper, then the Earth's core is like a butt-ton of iron. Um, and I should specify in the Earth's crust, uh, of those two elements listed, silicon's more common, but of course, these are all silicates, so oxygen is actually the most common element in the Earth's yeah. crust. Um, so I was being specific that, you know, of these two elements, which is more abundant. Yeah. So yeah, elemental abundance depends on, you know, you have to define it pretty carefully. Like, in the Earth's crust, yeah. oxygen is most abundant, then silicon, then aluminum, etc. In the Earth's core, iron, it's almost, you know, it's an iron, molten iron alloy, basically, it's Earth's core. Yeah. Um, in, the, in the universe, it's hydrogen, so, you know, different abundances, different places on the planet and stuff like that. <laughs> Huggy Bear spent their points wisely, they requested a factoid. I think <laughs> that one's related to one of the elements, at least. Oh, okay. Um, Congratulations, so... Huggy Bear, again. You, you got the Dark Horse Rods. 41 to 1 payout is pretty solid. Okay, so, yeah, this is related to one of those two elements, uh, aluminum. While aluminum is extremely common in the Earth's crust, processing it, getting it out of its ores, because, like, aluminum ores are aluminum 3+, plus, and they're oxides and stuff like that, getting pure aluminum metal out of those ores takes a lot of energy. Um, so back in the 1800s, it was, like, an expensive process that took a lot of, you know, perfecting and, you know, study. So the Washington Monument, at the very top of the Washington Monument, has a small aluminum pyramid at its apex. And at the time of its casting, which was 1884, that was the largest piece of piece of cast aluminum in the world. <laughs> and it's actually, you know, it, that pyramid on the Washington Monument, it's been, is the tip of a lightning rod. And they decided to make it out of aluminum because they wanted to basically flex. Because, yeah. you know, aluminum was really expensive back then because they couldn't get it out of the ores really easily. And so they, it's like a, you know, 20 centimeters on a side and 40 centimeters tall. That's the pyramid. And that's the tip of a lightning rod. <laughs> so, um, not exactly the best choice for lightning rods because when, you know, uh, it's been damaged by lightning strikes because aluminum has say. a relatively low melting point. Yeah. But um, back then it was like, you know, ooh, aluminum. It's so special. Awesome. Yeah. Now we just use it as foil. So. <laughs> and yeah. soda cans, yeah. beer cans. Yeah, mm, yeah that's right. <laughs> no, so, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, but, you know, casting it back in 1884, you know, they had to, like, get it pure, which you know, took some doing, but, oh. you know, now, of course, the one, once they invented the whole heroic process or whatever the heck that is, yeah, um, then they couldn't process it pretty So, so pretty that was it. We knew where to access aluminum because it's, it's fairly abundant. We just didn't know how to process it. Yeah. And that was the big deal. Yeah. So just walk right. <laughs> this is a long level of walking right. Uh -huh. This is a long game of walking right. Huggy Bear, congratulations again on your win, and thank you for requesting a factoid, but it's really fun. So they've replaced it or they've repaired it? They've repaired it. Okay. I mean, it's just a giant chunk of aluminum. Yeah. Uh, and presumably the surface is just oxidized. And, yeah. Um, you know. There's some lightning damage. The surface is a little bit of, a little bit oxidized. Mm -hmm. The good thing about aluminum is when it oxidizes, it forms a very thin layer of aluminum oxide, and that stops any further oxidation. So you can jump in that car if you would like. Nice. All right, Huggy Bear has a fun question. With different melting points of different elements, why can we not just heat things up to certain temperatures and sort them all out? Um, okay. It's basically using gradiated heating or melting cycles. Um, well, that's sort of how they purify silicon. Yeah. But, you know, uh, the simple answer is Just when you press it right. <laughs> when, when you when you melt all the elements together, they start alloying. They start forming compounds. They start forming intermetallics. So you're going to get complex alloys um, instead of pure elements. But there are specific ways to melt ingots um, like silicon. They use they use this melt refinement technique where they basically they take a ring. So they have like a cylinder of silicon. 
and they take a heated ring and they run it along the cylinder of silicon and it's called zone melting or zone refining and as the ring goes through the silicon it basically sweeps all the impurities out of it so that's how silicon that's used in computer chips and stuff that's how um that's how it's purified um and they take advantage of the fact that the impurities are like more soluble in the melt than they are in the solid so as they move that melt along the cylinder they basically they're sweeping the impurities out of the silicon so that's a uh, one of the processing uh, steps of making the really, really pure silicon for um, computer chips and uh, stuff like that. So jump over on? this wall. Uh, it's a wall of garbage cans, believe it or not. So yeah, tapping B. But Huggy Bear, I, I, I think the answer is they do that sometimes, but it gets hard. Like Susan said, when you mix things together, the properties start getting weird. So you have a really quick tap, yep. And press right. Oh, there you go. <laughs> a oh, physics man. be damned. <laughs> so man. Just levitation. <laughs> so what game gets physics right and what gets it wrong? The answer is dark. Yeah. The gradient. I mean, that's that's a billion dollar industry figuring mm -hmm. out how to separate metals and things like that. Yeah, and I mean, com computer chips require like parts per billion pure silicon. Yeah. So. Um, I remember when seeing this question, I was like, the first thing jumped in my mind was it an issue of not knowing where to find aluminum or not being able to process it? Uh, not being able to process it properly. Yeah. Um, you know, the melting was, you know, it was hard to cast because, you know, it would oxidize at high temperature and um, it would have air bubbles in it. So mm -hmm. the, the guy who managed to do it, um, it took some doing. <laughs> yeah. Patented it make the big bucks, create an award in your name, Alfred yeah. Nobel style. Well, I was kind of surprised that, you know, there's there's inscriptions on that little aluminum pyramid, and they don't include the dude who made it. It's like, that is just rude, okay? Oh, wait, Come what, on. what's written on it? Oh, something like, uh, this cap was commissioned by so-and-so and set, uh, uh, you know, in the monument on this date, and blah, 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 blah. But they didn't have the name of the guy that made it. Hmm. I mean, that sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. build your progress on the backs of people that actually innovate and create. Yeah. Looking at you, Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, boy. Such a brilliant engineer. So you want to get in the car. You go down the bottom of the screen, it should buy you some driving time. There you go. <laughs> Susan, I'm sorry you're playing this game. It's pretty mindless, thankfully. You're playing this for the first time ever. Turns out this was actually originally an arcade game. This was one of the ones that set off the uh, uh, video games cause violence and stuff. Really? So you go down, you can walk around it. Yeah, so blowing up clowns and murdering dogs, generally frowned upon by the uh, the Christian right of America. But oh, man. so it goes. And Debbie sent me a list of... Uh, and books or books that have been on banned or controversial lists and it's absolutely tragic what's on that but well i mean didn't they ban some math books because of some social commentary or something they did I in mean, florida dude, God, really? <laughs> yep oh, florida man strikes again mm. yeah but like even important here's a who and like the lorax and like these are controversial so you want to get in the car and if you stay at the bottom you'll be good for the rest of the level I mean, it just takes one person complaining loudly enough and no one opposing them. There you go. Yep. Just press right and you'll go to the end of the level. Or pretty much the end of the level. All right, we're closing out. We have about 13 minutes left. Uh, Dr. Susan LaTurner is happy to answer any questions you have uh, about inorganic chemistry, crystal growth, crystal properties, X-ray diffraction, molten metal synthesis, also known as flux synthesis. Uh, she is happy to answer those questions. She also has one factoid remaining if ever anyone wants to drop a uh, uh, request a factoid on us. <laughs> Huggy Bear, you're rich. <laughs> uh, standard internet units. Got through your questions. Some of them were lopsided some yeah. of them were good did this change how you decide next time I'm yeah the question don't, don't don't give away it's like don't make them like obviously trick questions because then they're you know obviously gonna it's weird meta information is a underappreciated aspect of question writing like what 
some conscious information are you delivering? Huggy <laughs> Bear redeemed from your request a factoid. No pressure, but yes, you delivered on that. Susan, what's your last? Okay, uh, another uh, element factoid. Um, tin undergoes a structure change below 13 degrees C, which can cause it to crumble into powder. Um, this is referred to as tin pest, and sometimes, uh, like the some of the older pipe organs in the colder countries in Europe um, have been basically observed to be crumbling because they were made out of pure tin, and from, you know, winters, basically the temperature got below 13 degrees C, and that caused the tin to change its structure, and um, therefore, uh, as it changed the structure, instead of it, uh, it would uh, basically. That's, that's fun. So, so pipe organists they have a name for it. <laughs> like this is an identified, well-known phenomena. Yeah. Which is kind of awesome. Tin pest. Yeah. Tin pest. Now, there's a there's a, an urban myth that or an urban legend that uh, Napoleon's defeat was caused by the fact that his military used tin buttons on their um, on their uh, uniforms. And um, when they were invading Russia, um, how do I get through this door? Yeah, just a little bit right. There you go. Okay. Um, uh, as they were walking through Russia, it was freezing cold, and their buttons started crumbling, and they froze to death. That's not true, but um, tin pest has been seen in things like uh, pipe organs and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's pretty. Now it is a slow process. This uh, uh, conversion of tin from its high temperature structure to its low low temperature structure and it can be prevented by alloying it with certain elements so you can prevent tin pest by just using instead of pure tin you use tin alloyed with a different metal like a mm -hmm. uh, bismuth or you know so you want to grab that card yeah there's there's a fun book there's a couple popular chemistry books one is uh disappearing spoon which mm -hmm. we talked about earlier with gallium that's one of the 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 titular storylines there's another one called napoleon's buttons that actually yeah. goes over this yeah and yeah, they they even addressed that's probably not what actually happened. Yeah, but it's a fun story. Well, that's just poor military planning. That's why Napoleon was beaten. Yeah, well, no, I mean, freaking marching invade Russia, Russia. In, uh, in winter. <laughs> so you want to go up through this door, but not too far up. Man, these guys. God, yeah. God damn it. Well, that's Joe Rockhead. <laughs> so yeah, you go up, but don't press up after you get through, and then go left. Left. Silver card over there. So yeah, Napoleon's bu Buttons, it's a fun read. 17 molecules that changed history, and it goes through things like nitroglycerin and stuff like that. And yeah, that, that, that I think that and uh, Disappearing Spoon are the most popular mainstream chemistry books. I mean, there's some like classic like Linus Pauling writings and stuff, but in terms of modern chemistry storytelling, it's kind of fun. All right, if anyone has any last-minute questions for Susan, she is happy to answer them. We are out of predictions and factoid. We spent them all. <laughs> so, so, Susan, when I first asked you about predictions and factoids over email, mm -hmm. is this what you expected? <laughs> no, I didn't know what to expect. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. a weird ask, right? It, uh -huh. it, yeah. It's hard to explain. But it turns out it works out nice. It's like a conversational piece. Like, mm -hmm. you can control what you're talking about or initiate a discussion about different factoids questions so you're going right in the door right up here you have to fight this rambo character right there then you're going to go then you're going to go left this is the only level where you go left <laughs> so as you're going left you're going to have to use bullets on these guys and one will drop a green card man do i have any questions left um, oh, this is a fun one. We've kind of covered this a little bit, but what will be the next major breakthrough in your field in the next 10 years? Uh, what is the, the changes the way everyone does business type discovery? This major breakthrough in my field. Uh, uh, oh, the insane card? Um, Next major breakthrough that changes the way... Oh, there's the green card. You got it. Nice. Go 
further left. Try the green card thing again. It should. Yeah, there we go. Huh. Um. Yeesh. <laughs> I'm. I guess a good breakthrough would be if you, you were able to do. Um. I mean, right now, what you can do is you can do X-ray diffraction. You can do variable X variable temperature X-ray diffraction to um, look at compounds that are precipitating. You can do PDF at high temperatures, but doing both um, is difficult. So, getting to the point where you know that becomes sort of automated, where you get all this information all at once, and you don't have to plan like. Two separate experiments or you know work with two two separate teams to do first the diffraction experiment and then the pdf experiment mm -hmm. that way you could basically map out what's happening as you you know take a solution from its molten state nucleate some you know you form some clusters and then they gather together and form a crystal structure and you can see how the crystal structures change and interconvert and stuff like that so some experiment that you can just follow at, you know, all the way down without having to plan, like, multiple experiments and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That would be awesome. Um, other things would be... Um, it would be great if we could sort of unite diffraction and electronic calculations. Because mm. um, right now that's, like, separate. You do diffraction, you get the structure of a compound, and then you need to take that information and put it into, um, you know, a separate uh, program, a separate so software package in order to get um, band structure uh, calculations. I wish, like, it was all just one thing. Mm -hmm. It can't be that hard. <laughs> I, I mean, it should be, you know, the diffractometer should come with something like, as soon as you get the structure, it'll spit out the band structure for you. Yeah. Um, that'd be awesome. Because um, huh. right now everything is sort of separate. I mean, it's interesting. So both things you listed are tools yeah. to essentially make everyone's lives easier, which mm -hmm. is underappreciated. Like how big of an impact these tools have. Just like thinking about tax rate of fraction and mm -hmm. understanding structure or NMR and organic chemistry changed everything. Am I killing cops here? What's going on? <laughs> they are they are not cops, at least as far as I know, but <laughs> they are blue suit wearing guys. Oh, <laughs> All right. Huggy Bear, if you couldn't do what you're doing, what career would you choose? Uh keep going right. There'll be a card door that you already have the key for. So if I couldn't do what I'm doing... What career would you choose? Or what would be an intriguing career? Hmm... Jeez... Mm, uh... I guess working in industry, does that count as something different, well, or...? We'll say outside, if you had to do something outside of chemistry. So... Like outside of science altogether, or outside of... It's up to you, Huggy Bear. You can clarify if you want. We'll start to say outside of chemistry for now. Um... Uh... <laughs> Just for fun. <laughs> no <laughs> obligation to pursue said career. <laughs> uh... You have that card, too, yeah. I guess I could be, I could be a writer. Yeah. Um... And we spend a lot of time writing. Yeah, because, you know, you basically have to be able to present your results in written form because that's how proposals are judged. That's how papers are judged. So you do develop, you know, writing ability. Yeah. So you have to. Yeah. And I think that's underappreciated by our students. Their career is going to be a lot of writing. Yeah. Yeah. It's like an, I've had some like really good writers in my group, but, you know, uh, some of the students, I basically write their papers for them because, you know, it's just just not a skill they, they have or develop. It's like some of them are actually, you know, there's actually scientific writing courses, which some of my students take, and that's that's awesome because it really helps them. Mm -hmm. um, 
but uh, I mean it's hard because they don't write that many papers in grad school like yeah. you get you know maybe a couple I mean you get at least one at FSU but at best you get you know three four something mm -hmm. like that right all right so now you got to shoot the guy in the wheelchair with a rocket wow really <laughs> That's mr. big he's a drug dealer it's fine <laughs> it's freaking dog dude. <laughs> oh sorry susan <laughs> this is the cost of winning the war on drugs <laughs> we're, we're in america here <laughs> Oh, so close. <sighs> he is very agile in that wheelchair. <laughs> Impressively <Yeah>. so. <laughs> yeah, writing would be a curious... I mean... Yeah, because one of the things I noticed... Uh, not that bookstores exist anymore, but if you ever go to a bookstore and look at the science section, mm -hmm. there's, you know... And, and not just the textbooks. If you look at, you know, writing about science and scientists writing, physicists write prolifically mm -hmm. and it's like you know it's all like monks dancing on the by you know pin of a you know head of a pin or whatever yeah. and like biologists like the secret of life and blah 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 chemists there's like maybe two yeah it's like uncle tungsten and what's the other one um yeah so they're like rolled hoffman has a couple of books yeah so it'd be cool you know i have actually thought about like writing not a chemistry textbook but you know just a book about chemistry and chemistry being cool but i i'm not sure what i would put in it um maybe that maybe i'd do that after i retire or something mm -hmm. I don't know. well that's a it goes to a bigger problem chemistry has and that our, our public outreach is not particularly good yeah and i've, I've seen there's there's i mean people have studied this and, and there are uh, research into it and the, one of the problems that chemistry has that biology and physics like physics has the awe of bigness yeah, right? the or universe really smallness yeah. or fastness and biology has the direct relevance to life right but chemistry doesn't have those you know readily digestible things instead we have anecdotes about buttons and things yeah. like that right and it's i mean it's very useful and we think it's cool but like in terms of accessing the general public yeah i mean so i, I told my students if i was ever going to write a popular chemistry book it would be like debunking bullshit kind of <laughs> like you can use your chemical knowledge thermodynamics kinetics to show why some of this stuff doesn't make sense mm -hmm. why it, why it can't be the way people are saying things should happen yeah um one thing chemistry does have is like you know the energy crisis that's going to be that's chemistries to solve yeah um because you know i can't see biology doing it you know physics no it's going to be a chemical solution so i mean that's what's frustrating about it is that chemistry is still maintained there you go <sighs> so two more <laughs> two, two more what yes yeah, two more you have to hit the wheelchair guy two more times oh, but like chemistry is is the central science and it really binds those things together but it's public perception of it is just not as as positive or as welcoming right because like yeah. you can name a dozen physicists who go on tv and talk about physics yeah right? I mean, and astrophysics and, yeah, and, yeah neil degrassi tyson and and, bill you know, nye the science guy yeah, exactly yeah. but like who's the chemist that does that yeah <laughs> can we create a chemistry-based video game <laughs> that there were efforts like the nsf does fund projects like this and i saw a video game at some point where it was like haber bosch process and you had to mix hydrogen and nitrogen and stuff and i mean they've they've definitely tried mm -hmm. it's it's just not typically not very fun yeah which kind of sucks but yeah, speaking of the Haber-Bosch process, one of the best chemistry books, you know, that I picked up was like a, The Alchemy of Air. I think mm -hmm. that's what it's called. And it's all about the development of the Haber-Bosch. I think mean, it's Haber-Bosch. That's Haber. Haber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, German word. German. Yeah. Um, and yeah, because that's an exciting story. It's like Fritz Haber was a Jew in Germany at the worst time to be a Jew in Germany. And, you know, he had to do all this stuff while he was, you know, being hunted and stuff like that, basically. And, yeah. um, and so, yeah, the development of the Haber-Bosch process, basically, you know, without that, you could grow enough food on the planet to feed maybe four billion people. Yeah. And, like, point out the problem, how many billion, you know, there's seven billion people on the planet right now. It's half the population. Yeah, yeah, so, and that's only possible because we got the ammonia for fertilizer from the Haber-Bosch process. Mm -hmm. um, of course, that leads to other problems, like, you know, the ammonia winds up um, 
going into the gulf and causing algae blooms and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, it supercharges the soil so we can grow food to feed the population. Yeah. So that's another chemistry problem to solve. Can we develop a fertilizer that can supercharge the soil and feed the world, but not without, you know, flushing into the gulf and creating dead zones and algae and yeah. all that stuff? Um, but yeah, the alchemy of air. That 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 book. It's a very, very interesting huh. um, description of all that stuff that went down. Yeah, Haber. You know, Fritz Haber was. He was a very disturbed guy. Um, <laughs> so they, they continued the story after the. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, even before he worked on the the, the Haber Bosch process, um, he was sort of the father of chemical warfare. Yeah. Because he was, you know, one of the first ones to figure out if we use chlorine, if we release a bunch of chlorine gas and all these. This was back in World War One. Um, so yeah, World War One was the chemists' war because Fritz Haber was basically saying if we release a bunch of chlorine into these trenches, all those enemy soldiers will die. Yep. And so they did, and his wife was so horrified about that that he committed that she committed suicide because she was also a chemist and didn't like the sort of use, you know, the horrific use of chemistry. Um, but yeah, so you know, Fritz Haber, you know, he was horrible in that he invented chemical warfare, but he was awesome in that he invented a way to you know turn air into fertilizer, basically. Um, so yeah, he had a sort of a mixed career. <laughs> Say it gently. <laughs> yeah, and so that book is really good. It talks about you know um, all of the things they went through during the World War One and World War Two, because he was working at uh, you know in addition to fertilizer. Um, guess what else the Haber Bosch process is, can be used for? It can be used to. Uh, um, create fuel, and that's how Germany was able to stay in World War II for so long, because they used um, Haber's invention to nice. fuel their tanks and stuff like that. Gold card. Where's the gold card? Right here. Oh. We got it already. We got it. Okay. All right. So we are almost done. So I'm gonna let you fight this boss for a little bit, but this boss is a huge pain in the ass. So if you don't mind, I'll intervene. Okay. I'll cool. jump in because <laughs> it is. You have to jump and shoot the rocket in the air. Oh man! Yeah, no, it's 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 a pain in the ass. Mr. Pin. Oh, this is the boss. Yep. Okay, you go. Yeah, ahead. yeah. So, so this is turns out to be really hard. You gotta like get to the top of the screen. He's some sort of flying saucer boss. What's going on yeah. with this weird? Uh... And he's shooting tongues at you. <laughs> and so you have to shoot him in the top hat with a rocket. Oh man! Yeah. That is non-trivial. And then shoot him a couple times in the face. And that reveals the skeleton. And you have to shoot the vertebrae at specific times. No, this is a pain in the ass, and I know way too much about this video game. Yeah. God, I'm going the wrong direction. Come on. There we go. So he's on some flying There spot. we go. And they turn into birds, and then they... See. Okay. Now you get to play Civil Forfeiture the level. Very close to 8 billion people now, which is crazy. We had Matt Hauer on, who's a sociologist that studies human population. He said it's going to peak at about 10 to 11 billion. So that'll be 2050 or somewhere around there. I yep. can't, you know, man, cities freak me out. I can't even imagine, you know? <laughs> I just, I don't like huge groups of people. Yeah. A little too... No, it's terrifying, especially if a storm comes through or power goes out yeah. or food supplies cut short. And everybody just... Uh... You have the gold card? Okay. There we go. There it is. 3556. Congratulations. You won the war on drugs. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. it's the little victory, so we take our wins as we get them. Yeah. Well, there's another challenge for chemists. Like, can chemists... Uh make a sewage system for a city that doesn't end up stinking in the summer because that's the thing about cities i can't stand they all have that sewage smell yeah because yeah. there's like billion you know millions of people in a city and you know systems can't handle that much sewage so if the population keeps going you know there's a challenge for a chemist can we get something to help with all that like immediately turn it into fertilizer or manure or something you know do something like that. Am I putting my initials here? It's up to you. It doesn't matter. It's not going to save, but you might as well. Pride and victory. 
brings you back to the arcade days <laughs> when you get to claim your seat and well, tell like somebody like, unplugged put, put it. Put something, uh, you know, can is a doofus or something. <laughs> you only get three letters, <laughs> so your answers are ass or USA <laughs> or <laughs> it's somewhat limited. Mm. <laughs> but go to end, and that is the end of NARC. And also the end of our stream. <laughs> Everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, stick around. We'll figure out somebody to raid. But um, it's uh, always a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Ask Scientist Gaming, Mediocre Gameplay, Expert Science. Today, Susan LaTurner was kind enough to join us and play video games for the first time in like 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Susan, any parting words for the audience? Um, uh, we need more chemists because there's plenty of problems to solve. So... Uh, hopefully you like chemistry and, you know, we're looking for future chemists because we need some smart people. Yeah. Huggy Bear, that means you. Thank you for joining us as usual. Um, two weeks, we'll, our guest will be another chemist, Mike Roper, a colleague in our department that does analytical chemistry. In particular, he studies diabetes and um, using like lab on a chip technology and microfluidics to measure and quantify diabetes and treat it and things like that. So he'll be back. He was a previous guest, but he was doing it remotely and his controller died. So he gets an in-person visit where he actually gets to play games. So that, that should be pretty fun. So yeah, join us again in two weeks. Um, until then... Uh, it's a been a pleasure, and we'll see you guys next time.